Hi everyone, my name is Sienna Perry from APNIC and welcome to the very first Networking From Home event. As we know, COVID-19 has forced many NOG meetings to be cancelled or postponed. But just because we can't meet in person doesn't mean we can't come together virtually. So here we are at the very first Networking From Home, a virtual event for network engineers and technical folk in the Asia Pacific to share their experiences and expertise with their peers, just like they would at a NOG event. Presentations will be kept fairly short and interaction is very much encouraged. I'll get into housekeeping in a moment, but we want to hear your questions, your comments, and if you're daring, we'd love to, for you to share a photo of you and your networking from home setup on Twitter or Facebook using the hashtag NFH. Now, before I hand over to Jeff for the keynote, I'd like to remind you, if you want to ask a question or comment during the Q&A, you can either use the raise hand function in Zoom and you'll join the queue for a voice question or comment, or use the Q&A button on Zoom for text and I will read out your comment or question. We'll have limited time for questions because we've got a packed schedule, so please make them great. If you don't get a chance to ask your question, you can email nfh at apnic.net and we'll forward the email to the speaker for you. Use Zoom chat to chat with your fellow attendees or for any questions you have about the event using Zoom or issues not related to the presentations. More help is available on the NFH website. Please be mindful of the code of conduct published on the NFH website and in the chat box. Now, these events would not be possible if it weren't for the effort and collaboration of the NOGs of the Asia Pacific. Particular thanks go to all the PC volunteers from NOGS in the region. As I'm sure you know, NOGS are a vital part of the internet community. If you haven't participated in your local NOG before, please do find out more and get involved. I'm sure you'll find it really rewarding. There's a link to all the NOGS in the region in the NFH website. We have a great lineup of speakers for you today, as you can see. And the first is our esteemed keynote, Jeff Houston. Over to you, Jeff. Thanks for that, um, and certainly good morning, good afternoon, whatever, to all of you. Um, I don't know about you, but I must admit, I really enjoy NOG meetings, and the last few months has been hard. I'm like, I've just missed it. So I've missed the geek stuff. And, and so today, I actually do want to do a pretty geeky kind of talk. And the talk I'm actually doing is actually about the glue that holds this entire internet together, the interdomain routing protocol, the border gateway protocol, BGP. We're all getting old and BGP is no exception. Um, 31 years old. When it was first deployed back in the NSF net in the late 1980s, 1989, I think, could have even been 88, the internet had an astonishing 5,000 routes. And um, at the time, Merit, the operators of the NSF, were using IBM PC XTs to hold it all together, if anyone remembers them. Um, <laughs> the internet was a runaway success, but the problem for these poor old IBMs is that after 20,000 routes in the routing table, they collapsed. Um, <laughs> one of those success victim stories. But, you know, the internet's grown like crazy. We've gone from kilobit circuits and a few thousand routing entries to something around today where we're running gigabit approaching terabit circuits and the number of entries in the routing table is approaching a million. But it's the same routing protocol. And even weirder, there's no management. There's no panel of BGP. When you set up a route, you don't have to ask permission. It's completely unmanaged. It's an anarchy. There's no routing police. Bad deeds go unpunished. Good deeds go unrewarded. It's actually really very surprising that this completely unmanaged space works and actually works surprisingly well. And what I want to do in the next whoa, 25 minutes or so is to actually have a look at the state of BGP in 2019 and 2020, and actually see how well it's been managing, in spite of the fact that no one's in control. 
It just runs itself. So the BGP routing system is actually one of the few systems that brings all the internet back to you because the entire internet comes to your BGP view. And this lens of routing is actually the lens of the entire network. It's not a perfect lens, and my view is different to your view, but even so, there's a lot we can learn about the internet as a whole when we simply look at BGP. Now, the first of these views is actually some of the history of the internet. Uh, I've taken January 94 as the start point, that's when we first started doing data. This is a snapshot of BGP from route views taken every hour for 30 odd years. Um, it's a lot of data behind this graph. Oddly enough, we thought we were heading for a disaster in 1994 and we introduced classless domain routing to save the internet from imminent disaster. That's down on the bottom left. You probably could see if you had a microscope. Um, the next big event was actually the great boom and bust of the early 2000s, 2001, with this wave of euphoria uh, that went around the internet that it was going to do everything. And then in 2001, the great bust, when we realized that, you know, it wasn't that good. It was, it was a, certainly a different communications technology, but not that good. Um, but the bust lasted for, gee, about three months, and then we were back on it again. And the true explosion of the internet happened over the next 10 years. When we went from dial-up modems to DSL, all of a sudden the internet became plug and play. All of a sudden businesses took on and the consumer market simply exploded. And across that period to 2012, it was one of these up and to the right stories. You'll see around 2011, we ran out, or at least the IANA ran out of IPv4 addresses. Did it stop BGP? Nah, just kept on growing. And we've been running on various forms of empty through the rest of the next nine years without any drop in pace. The routing table just keeps on getting bigger and bigger and bigger. This is a more detailed view of just the last couple of years. And why all the lines? Because I'm actually looking at two different sets of what we call collectors. A number of folk send their BGP route tables to route views, a project hosted at the University of Oregon, uh, supported by the NSF actually, thanks to them. And also a number of folk uh, all over the world, but predominantly in Europe, um, send their route sets to the routing information service run by the RIPE NCC. Oddly enough, there's some quite weird banding. There's around 10,000, 20,000 more routes in America than there are in Europe. Weird. And equally, we can't agree on what default is because all of these providers who send their route sets certainly believe they have all the routes in the internet, but they don't. Everyone has a different collection of routes, subtly different. And everyone actually sees a subtly different set of addresses. We actually don't know what default is, it's smeared across all of those providers one way or another. But interestingly, as I said, there's a fair amount of diversity at the edges on what is connected to the internet and what isn't. But across all those peers, one thing is pretty certain, the big red line, it just continues to grow. So let's drill into that growth and actually see what it looks like. No more IPv4 addresses but lots and lots more routing prefixes. Um, we're still growing by about 55,000 prefixes per year, a little over 4,000 per month. And that growth is almost linear and has been since 2012. It's like this machine we just can't stop, but somehow we keep on inventing out of no new addresses, more and more routing entries. It's not an exponential growth. It's not a polynomial growth. It's actually a pretty solid linear growth. We also look at the number of people who are playing, who have their own autonomous system number, who actually have their own place in the BGP universe and assert their own independent routing policies. This is predominantly a Northern Hemisphere thing rather than a Southern Hemisphere. The, the ASs are sort of more prevalent in Europe and North America than they are in our part of the world. But again, this inexorable growth, like a machine, 
around 3,400 new AS numbers every single year. And the AS count just keeps on going up linearly. We're currently at 66,000 autonomous system numbers and it's just keeping on growing. Um, the other thing that's kind of weird is that BGP services two needs and they're actually a little bit different. One is that BGP maintains this sort of map of how to get from me to you, and from you to me, it's connectivity. But as well as that, we actually use BGP to give us the best path. For some people, best is cheapest, and that's perfectly reasonable. For other folk, it's highest bandwidth or best quality of service. So we use BGP for actually engineering traffic. And the common way of doing this is to advertise more specifics because more specifics always win. So more specifics, in other words, more specifics of an existing advertisement, take up slightly more than one half of the entire routing table and has done for more than 10 years. Around 52 to 53% of the routing table actually doesn't add more connectivity, it refines it with traffic engineering. Been like that for years, no sign of it stopping. And here's why we're actually able to make more and more routing advertisements without any more addresses. That bottom right graph shows that the average size of a routing advertisement just keeps on getting smaller and smaller and smaller. The decline is linear, but it's inexorable. Currently, the average size of a routing advertisement is around three and a half thousand individual addresses, or if you think about it, around 15 slash 24s. But it's not a 20 slash 24, it's a slash uh, 2021. I think we're going to see slash 24s in a few years. It's just that's going to be the lingua franca. And there's going to be a little bit of a, a discussion amongst ourselves as to who's going to be the first to admit slash 25s into the global routing table. Inevitable? Probably. Uh, what else can we see in the routing table? Well, this is the one graph over here at the top right. We can actually see the fact that we really did run out of addresses. It's now visible. By 2016, we stopped adding addresses to the routing system and we've been flat ever since. On the bottom is an interesting graph about the shape of connectivity. No one likes being a customer of anyone else. And so when we add new networks, they tend to try and add to the middle, not add to the edge. So the average AS path length, as I see it where I am, back on the edge of my internet, has been 5.6, 5.7, and it's actually getting slightly smaller. The network, as it grows, is getting denser, almost like a neutron star. But as we add more folk in, it doesn't get bigger, it just gets denser. Um, almost everyone's a customer. Out of these 66,000 odd ASs, 55,000 of them or so only have one or two adjacencies. There's stubs out on the edge. And in fact, only 10 ASs actually carry more than 1,000 uh, adjacencies. Now, your list might differ from my list, but those 10 are on the slide as I see them from where I sit in the internet. But those folk carry everyone else's routes one way or another. So those adjacencies tend to point out to who carries the bulk of transit out there today. As I said, your list might be subtly different from that, but generally there's only a very small number of folk who actually carry the bulk of connectivity. So what can we say about V4? Well, business as usual. We've run out of addresses years ago. It doesn't seem to have stopped anything. We're up to 840,000 routes in the routing table, still growing. 51 to 55,000 new entries a year, 3,400 ASs a year, nothing's changing. All we're doing is making the prefixes shorter and shorter. And I guess we're accommodating growth through NATs. So what about address exhaustion? Well, it's very, very real. Um, Aaron's got nothing left. LACNIC, nothing left. RIPE, the RIPE NCC, nothing left. The last slash eight is still just managing to sort of hold water in APNIC, but the current projections show that we, we're not gonna have any by about January next year, unless of course you guys get enthusiastic, in which case it'll be earlier. And Afrinic, well, oddly enough, Afrinic's on this point, the stats say that they're going to run out slightly earlier, around December of this year. I may be off, but it's certainly, we're at the last final points of the available RIR pools. It's all over. 
So what's driving the growth now? I mean, the internet hasn't stopped growing and addresses aren't going to stay where they are. Um, is it transfers? Is it leasing and address recovery? One thing I did look at to try and see this is, does the routing table tell you anything? So what I did is I compared the routing table in January to the routing table in December and looked at all the addresses that had appeared through that year, all the new addresses. And I looked at the age of those addresses. When were they allocated? So in 2010, the routing table grew, but 80% of those new addresses were actually allocated or assigned by the RIRs in that year. So almost all the growth was coming out of the RIRs into the routing table. Now, I've done that year after year after year. And the big green line is last year, 2019. There are almost no new addresses coming out of the RIR system. And so what's going on is that the new addresses that are appearing in the routing system is actually mining our past through transfers and the reuse of legacy addresses. The more recent addresses, anything less than say 15 years old, is actually a transfer. The RIRs allocated a little while ago and it's been moved from someone to another and reappeared back in the routing system. This tail at the top right of 25, 30 years old is those early legacies of the A's and B's. And they've also been recycled. Over the years, it's been getting more and more as we mine our past and bring it back into the current routing system. So here's this sort of really big picture of a little over 20 years. This is the total amount of addresses that are assigned and in play in blue. And as you see, that curve of depletion is, is showing here. The blue line is not accelerating upward. The size of the routing table, well, the number of addresses advertised in it, the span is in green. And interestingly, not every address that's allocated is advertised. The red is the unadvertised address pool. Let's look at the last few years, that's 2013, and let's play a little trick busy slide, and zero everything at January 2019. Now, the theory goes <laughs> that the red line should fall, that we should be taking unadvertised addresses and recycling them in the transfer market and bringing them back into the advertised pool. The red line today should be less than the zero point of January 19. It isn't. In fact, it's actually you contradicted that theory that at certain points it's leapt upwards as previously advertised space has been pulled back out of the routing table. And you'll notice in April there was this massive move of a single slash eight that used to be advertised and now isn't. Uh, for those who are curious, it's 57 slash eight, originally allocated years and years ago to CETA. It's a legacy. The blue is the residual bits of addresses that have you know, been passed out from the RIRs, and the green is the change in the routing table. What does it look like in numbers? Well, we added a tenth of a slash eight, which is around uh, 1.6 million addresses. Would have been more, but CETA withdrew its slash eight. The RIRs actually assigned 0.8 of a slash eight. So RIPE did a little bit at the start of the year, um, Afrinic has done a quarter of a slash eight, Lacnic did a tiny amount, and uh, Apinic out of the last slash eight dribbled 0.07% of a slash eight. Um, so the net is uh, around 0.8 of a slash eight assigned by the RARs and around 0.7 slash eights added. So what we're really seeing is that legacy blocks and all those old addresses that used to be held by enterprises and ISPs are heading towards cloud data networks and content data networks. All those cloud service providers are gobbling up the addresses as fast as they can. That's V4, what about V6? For those fans of up and to the right, this is an up and to the right. This is clear growth. Uh, and if you're waiting for V6 to take off, I'm not sure you'll get a better picture than this. Uh, when V4 exhausted, not much happened, but over the last eight or so years, yeah, the growth has been inexorable and certainly impressive. Here's the last few years in detail. And again, 
We don't know what default is. We just can't agree. Everyone sees a slightly different routing table, even in V6, and actually sees a slightly different set of addresses in the V6 routing table. Whatever it is, we sort of agree on most of it, but we disagree in the details. Same sets of slides, uh, routing prefix is growing, but this time the growth is clearly exponential. 20,000 prefixes per year, but it is growing. AS numbers, yeah, slightly exponential. 2,000 ASN per year, don't forget V4 is 3,400, but that number's growing. Over the years, that's getting higher. More specifics, well, it's finally come of age. Um, one half of the routing tables now more in other than prefix sizes, which is the inverse of the number of actual addresses. The average size of a routing advertisement is getting smaller in V6, 30, a slash 30 going to a slash 31. And it's heading that way. Um, how far will it go? I don't know. Um, certainly no one's sort of pushing it the other way. So we're actually seeing inside the routing table a huge amount of slash 48s. Slash 48 seem to be the slash 24 of V4. And folks certainly believe, and I think they're right, that a slash 48 will be seen everywhere. Advertised address span, growing exponentially. Well, that's V6. And interestingly, the shape of the inter-AS connectivity, while V4 was getting slightly denser, V6 is actually blowing out a little bit, um, rising slightly. Um, I suspect it's actually a temporal thing. V6 was originally an overlay network and it was extremely dense. Everyone just connected to the tunnel brokers. As we're now replacing those overlays with real connections, the average AS path length is expanding out a little bit. And oddly enough, that's a good thing. I don't expect it to get much bigger. It will come back in over time. AS adjacencies, well, the numbers are different. Uh, three of them have more than 1,000 adjacencies rather than 10,000. But you'll actually notice that the tier ones in V6 are the same as the tier ones in V4. It's the same number of folk, folk that carry the bulk of the customer ASs. So 80% of the ASs in V6 are simply one or two adjacencies and only three have a thousand or more. So what we say about V6? Well, 20,000 route entries per year, lower growth than V4, but it is increasing. Where's this going? How big should your routers be? What's the projection of future size? Do you remember maths? This is the first order differential of the size of the V4 routing table day by day. And consistently, we're growing at around 150 route entries per day or 55,000 per year, increasing slightly. So we can actually use that to make some predictions. If you're buying a router today and you want it to carry in its high-speed memory, if that's what you want, a full V4 routing table, you're going to need to carry around 1.1 million uh, entries in the routing table in the FIB in about five years' time. Um, possibly a bit more, but certainly that's a reasonable estimate of where we're going. Um, what about V6? Well, it is growing from 20 a day to 40 a day to 60 a day and still rising. So in some ways, that linear projection of the V6 table size is a lower bound. Uh, 182,000 entries in five years' time is very much a lower bound. The upper bound, which extrapolates an exponential growth, 400,000 entries. And don't forget, each of these entries is four times bigger than, than V4. So within five years, the amount of actual memory you're going to have to devote to a V6 routing table in your router will be more than the memory you need for the V4 routing entries. We're going to get that crossover in around four years' time. Um, I don't think I've said anything new. Let's move on. Uh, last but not least, BGP is a chatty protocol. It's a really, really old protocol. And the way it works is that it keeps on telling you its best path until it doesn't get a better path. So the way BGP sifts the truth is simply by constantly updating. Now you'd expect like any distance vector protocol that as you have more and more things to route, you're gonna get more and more chattiness, that the chattiness is going to increase as the network gets larger. And chattiness means you're going to need more processing. You're going to have to devote more time to going, oh, that's an update. I better do something about it. 
So it's actually interesting to understand the level of updates in BGP. And if they're rising quickly, worry. If they're not rising quickly, be puzzled. So here's the big picture. 12 years of BGP updates. And what it shows in the yellow is the size of the routing table. Over that period from 2011, 300,000 entries up to around 850,000 entries, relatively linear growth. The number of withdrawals, even though the network has more than doubled, the number of withdrawals per day has actually been relatively steady. Why? Uh, there's a prize to anyone who can answer that. I don't know. And I've never heard anyone else to give me an answer either. That oddly enough, that part of the network has been quite consistent. That a bigger network doesn't necessarily have more withdrawals. What about the number of announcements? Well, again, it's sort of a curious thing. From 2009 through to 2013, dead set steady. The network grew, but the number of updates didn't. And again, a bit of instability in 2013, but it reached a new stability point from 2014 until around 2018, 2019, relatively stable. But then again, 2019, it just tipped over an edge, became a lot less stable. And today it's still a lot less stable. We're seeing between 200 and 300,000 updates per day. Is it gonna grow further? I don't know. I'm not even sure why it's being driven to this, but certainly it's a new state for the internet. But fascinatingly enough, even though the network is larger and it's more unstable, if you look at any individual prefix that gets updated and you go, well, how long does it take to figure out what its ultimate fate is? How long does it take for the routing protocol to converge to a stable state? Well, way back in 2009, it was 40 seconds. Today, it's around 60 seconds. That's amazing. It's still capped. The BGP is still performing at much the same level as it was basically 10, 12 years ago, even though the network is massively larger. Um, so that's one of the big victories in BGP. The network is still managing to perform at basically the same level of performance that it had 10 years ago over a much, much smaller network. So will your router cope? Well, as long as you have enough FIB memory, uh, it'll cope. Uh, the same CPU will cope, the time to converge will cope. There's no great problem sitting there in the IPv4 routing table. You can basically buy a router and plan for a service life running at a fault-free zone for five years. With, with these kind of factors built in, and you'll probably be okay. What about V6? Smaller network, but more bizarre. And again, not really sure why. Uh, the number of up, the number of withdrawals, firstly, the bright purple down there. So the yellow is the number of entries in the V6 routing table up and to the right. The number of withdrawals has started to rise and rise and rise. Why? Um, no answers. Again, a prize for anyone who guesses. Um, and the number of updates per day, the V6 routing table is a lot less stable. Now, my theory is no one's looking, no one cares. As long as V4 works, the help desk phone doesn't ring, no one looks. And I think the V6 routing table is actually a product of neglect and inattention. What about convergence performance? Don't forget V4, much bigger network, was converging in under 40, under 50 seconds, and in 2020 was only at 60. The V6 story is actually almost the opposite. It's been incredibly unstable. Over the years, I think it was these overlay networks, but equally and bizarrely, there was almost a seasonal periodicity that over each year, it sort of started low and went high. And as the year progressed, it got less and less stable. Truly odd. Um, it's converging at around 70 to 80 seconds. And I suspect that part of this convergence is the gradual stripping out of overlays and tunneling. Because as anyone who has done solid networking understands, do not tunnel. Tunneling is evil. Um, is BGP scaling? Well, yes, there's no need for a new protocol. 
Um, do you need new equipment? Well, <laughs> if you bought it five years ago, it's probably shot showing its age. The size of the fib, line speeds of getting up to hundreds of gigs, um, the cost of line cards and so on. Yes, you, you can expect basically changes there. And I suspect we're not going to load a full fib in each of the line cards. We're going to start using caching in the line cards because although the routing table might have close to a million entries, the number of entries that are actively used by traffic, well, Google, Akamai, uh, Netflix, uh, I'll give you a few more, but almost all of your traffic is going to sit within about 40 to 100 entries in your fib cards. So why do you need to pack in a million entries? No point really. I suspect the high capacity systems are going to run hot caches if they're not already. It's the only way to actually scale up speed. So if you're running a network, what do you need to do? Well, understand your high-speed fib capacity and have a look, particularly if you're doing a full mapped rib table into the line cards, review your partitioning. Because if you're running dual stack, within a few years, you're going to need basically close to a million V4 slots and around 150,000 V6 slots, four times the size, for a full routing table over the coming couple of years. So keep an eye on the way you've partitioned things because otherwise you're going to find routes falling out of your line card. Um, default really is your friend. There's no need to run a default, a full default free routing zone unless you are close to a tier one or doing phenomenally complex traffic engineering. Judicious use of default allows you to strip out a whole bunch of useless routes and drop your requirements for hardware and processing significantly. And as I said before, I think hot cache line cards are the only way through this, that using that kind of small but very hot cache reduces the memory requirement and therefore your cost, because that's the fastest memory in a router without any, any visible uh, routing performance. So that's it in the time allowed. I've actually allowed, geez, almost three minutes for questions. So uh, how do you want to handle this, Sienna? Will I throw back to you? Yes, you I'm so glad you asked, Jeff. Um, I would like to open up for questions and comments. We have one from Mark Pryor I will read out, but I'll just uh, go through the protocol with you quickly. You can either use the raise hand function in Zoom and you'll join the queue for voice uh, or use your Q&A button on Zoom for text and I can read out the question um, or comment to Jeff. If you don't get a chance to ask your question, because as Jeff said, we're pretty, pretty uh, pushed for time, you can email nfh at apnic.net and we'll forward the email to the speaker for you. So Mark Pryor asks, do you think damping has any impact on the difference between V4 and V6 with respect to announcement withdrawal? Wow. Um, I always think this argument about damping is close to religious. And I do not believe in route flat damping. I believe in MRI timing. And I think Cisco's use of MRI timing, where you only update your neighbor after between 27 and 30 seconds, is actually what saved the routing system. Because as we've got bigger, the MRI timers have actually stopped BGP being so enormously chatty. And the alternative approach, which I think Juniper does, probably still does, of not having MRI timers is actually less in BGP scaling interest. I don't think route flat damping has had a big influence there. But let me say up front, this is a religious debate uh, rather than anything else. So, you know, there are very many opinions on that. So next we have a question, uh, a voice question. Uh, Jing, can I please, um, can you state your name and affiliation when I allow you to talk, which is now? Please go ahead, Jing. Uh, Jing, if you can, if you can unmute, please. All right. Okay. Hey, hey, Jeff. Hi, guys. Hey. Hey, uh, look, uh, the last slides, Jeff, put here, I couldn't understand. What does the hot cache line card mean? If you're driving a 40 gigabit line, you have to do a lookup in your fib memory at a few billionths of a second to get the right routing entry. In other words, 
the FIB card memory is the fastest memory we know how to build. The problem is that memory speeds haven't increased for about 10 years. If you look at the speed of memory 10 years ago and the speed of memory today, it's the same. So how do you make a bigger and bigger lookup table when your memory speed has remained constant, yet you're trying to drive a faster line? About the only way through this in the long run is to reduce the size of that fib, actually store fewer things. Now, one way of doing this is to take your most popular routes, all of Google, all of Akamai, all of, you know, and you've still only got a couple of thousand routes and load up the fib. And for everything else, go to backup memory, go to slower memory and be prepared to lose a couple of packets before you bring that entry into the line card fib. In other words, treat the fib like a cache. Why? Because otherwise you can't afford, and we actually can't build full routing table memory that drives you know, multiple extremely high capacity routers driving at aggregate speeds of over a terabit. So this is this advice that you should now be looking for hot caches in line card fibs as being the way through this if you want to scale your speed. Thanks, Jeff. We've got two more questions and we've closed the uh, question line. The next question is from Brajesh Jain. What affects his legacy IP addresses over the last few months? Well, I, I pointed out that CETA have just withdrawn 57 slash 8. And I think we're finding that certainly there's a lot of interest in these early allocated slash 8s and slash 16s. And certainly the cloud providers have a thirst for IP addresses, which is unquenchable. And of course, cloud finds it very hard to use NAT. So the retail and access models of networking is certainly doing more and more intensive NATs, as well as doing V6 to try and get around the problem of no more addresses. But over in cloud land, um, they, need, they need IPv4. They still do. It's not going away. And the legacy area is the one that's fueling most of that. So they are important, particularly for CDNs. And final question from, and please, I apologize for any mispronunciations, Dewanga Alam. As we know, BGP v4 table is now approximately 800K. And how about v6 in the future? How many prefixes and how big router resources can handle that? Um, slide 31 answers your question. Uh, that's the five year lower and upper bound projection. So over five years, 182,000 to 395,000 entries in your V6 routing table if you're going to carry a full FIB. Um, you're going to need equipment to cope one way or another, either by buying larger and larger high speed memory units and line cards or using some kind of caching solution. Um, thank you very much all. I hope that's been fun. I've certainly enjoyed it and thank you for your questions. Thank you so you much, soon. Jeff. Thank, thank you, you, Jeff. Um, I'm now going to hand over to Willa Ortiz from PHNOG, who is the moderator of session one. And I would like to take a moment to say, please do take a photo of you working from home, networking from home, and share it on um, uh, Facebook or Twitter using the hashtag NH, uh, sorry, networking from home, NFH. <laughs> Thank you, Sienna. Hi, everyone. I'm Willa Ortiz from PHNOG and working in HGC. I'm also part of this Networking from Home program committee. Very pleased to meet you all. Anyway, I'd like to introduce our next speaker, who is the CEO and founder of Double Shot Security, who will be discussing about best practices on security and privacy, especially during this pandemic. Let's give it up for Marika Keo. Hello, everyone, and uh, thank you for having me participate in this particular event. I'm very excited to do this. And yes, I think security is on top of mind for everyone. Uh, they just want things to be secure and not have to think about it. Um, I am sorry to say that we all do have to think about it and probably more often than we want to. So I want to discuss a lot of the blind trust that we have and how can we revisit and really start uh, trusting our systems and our experiences more. 
So when I talk about blind trust, uh, over the years, I've seen that uh, we don't verify enough. So there's a lot of blind trust in protocol standards that, oh, of course they're secure. Well, not really, depending on when they were created and um, also what the considerations were. Um, I think it was about 10 years ago, uh, maybe a little bit more, that in the IETF, the Internet Engineering Task Force, they started creating uh, standards that also included security considerations. And that was an excellent move to then see how some of the protocols thought about uh, where security practices maybe needed to be more solid, but at that time that the protocol was created, they didn't know yet how to solve the problem, but at least they iterated what people needed to think about as they were implementing or deploying certain protocols. Um, when you talk about implementation guidelines, um, people have the best intent in mind and want to make sure that things are operational and as secure as possible, but security can change over time. And so best practices and guidelines that might have been best practices 10 years ago are not necessarily best practices today. But we have inherent trust when you're Googling best practice deploying, let's say, DNS open recursive or DNS recursive resolvers. Right? A lot of times the guidelines now tell you to configure DNS recursive resolvers but as open recursive resolvers. And that's not necessarily the most secure today. Device certifications. We have blind trust that if it's certified, it's gotta be good. Well, it depends on what the requirements are. Same with compliance mandates, documented policies, operational deployments. We just trust that things are as they should be, right? We also have trust in people that people will act responsibly. But really, we need to really double check. We need to trust but verify. And I did write a blog uh, a month ago for APNIC that talks about some of these items in more detail because I can't go into everything in the time that I have today. But what I want to spend time on is what are the critical items to validate right now during the epidemic where so many more people are working from home? And so the situation today is that you have a lot more people working from home who are not used to uh, not being in an office environment. And people are under stress, right? Your kids are at home. Um, maybe your husband or wife is also working next to you. Maybe you have a small room. Um, there's a lot of stresses involved today. And so the bad actors are really having a field day and taking advantage of the situation of today. And I have personally seen that my spam has increased tenfold. And primarily it's uh, telling me that I have delivery delays, even though I haven't ordered anything. Um, I get notifications that my email, email mailbox is full, right, from folks that um, aren't even part of my, uh, any of the email uh, uh, um, owners, right? I have multiple email addresses and so multiple um, entities that actually are responsible for um, emails. Um, what about verifying and approving documents or spreadsheets, right? People are getting very clever, the malicious actors to say, can you please approve this, click here. And then there's a myriad of notifications from healthcare, right, about personal protected equipment travel, travel canceled, banking, you know, look at this financial statement from the government in terms of any kind of uh, 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 lockdown or bans, entertainment, retail, what have you. And we really have to be much more careful before we click on anything, a document, a picture, a link. It doesn't matter how busy you are, really, you have to stop and think, wait a minute, is this actually real? And I have an example here. I receive quite a few of these on a daily basis, not the same ones, but this just showed up a couple of days ago. And I thought, oh, I'll take a screenshot because this is a good example. So I get an email right, sent to me that says my email password will expire in a few hours. 
Well, the first thing that I do is look at, well, who sent it? And sometimes all you see is a name that looks familiar, that's maybe a name that's of an executive or somebody in the IT department of your company. But then when you look further, right, it actually has an email address that doesn't make sense whatsoever, right? I mean, it doesn't come from anything that I know of. And this particular email is just me, right? It's my own domain. And I right away, of course, know that this is in no way, shape, or form realistic. But it was interesting, too, because I looked at the bottom. It's like copyright, you know, medica.com, security management. I'm like, well, that's me, and I didn't send this email. But really, it just points out that we have to be careful because I have gotten emails where sometimes I'm like, oh, why did they send me this? I got to click on this, and I just step back. And then I call people, I literally use my phone or I text them and say, did you send me something? And sometimes it's valid, but more often than not, it isn't. So just double check. I think we need to do that more, especially right now where so many criminals are trying to take advantage of, of innocent victims. Also identity management is absolutely crucial in having trust in digital environments. And I can't stress that enough. Um, we really need to pay attention to how are we validating the digital identities that we have. And a really good example showed up just a couple of days ago when the Ad Trust uh, root anchor uh, uh, certificate um, that's used as a root anchor or was for many other certificates expired. And so a lot of modern systems um, had taken care of that. You had a certificate that most other certificates would bind to as, as, as the root. But I had one system that was older. I still use it for certain applications and it didn't automatically have a valid root trust anchor. So what happens? Well, I get a window that pops up. You can see it at the bottom of the slide where it says that uh, the application, it was one of my mail addresses, can't validate, uh, verify the identity of the server. And it says, show certificate, just continue, ignore this message or cancel. Well, how many people hit continue, right? You should not do that. You should actually look at their certificate or just deny this because it could be a malicious actor trying to get access to your credentials. And for me, when this showed up, I immediately did a couple of searches and found out, oh, okay, this, this, this certificate expired. Here's what I have to do, bummer. But I also called up tech support because I wanted them to be aware of this and see if there's maybe anything else that I needed to also. And to my shock and horror, what I was told was, well, we've had one other call and you should just, just hit allow and that will have everything work. And I remember just pausing for a minute and the poor tech support guy, because I said, I am going to forget that you said this, but please don't do that to anybody else. What you really need to do is let people know how they need to update the certificate and never, never, never tell them that they should just allow an invalid certificate to be okay. And the reason that I'm so horrified and shocked is because there's too many people that do that. And as somebody pointed out uh, recently to me, it's almost like putting a physical lock in your door, but then just leaving the lock open, right? So these are issues that I don't know yet how to resolve, but we need to get better at really understanding what are our tech teams telling people to do? And to me, what's even more disconcerting is that I get that automatically newer devices wouldn't have this problem, but why wasn't I notified? And who should be notifying me? because there are many countries where you can't just run the latest equipment. You might be running five or six year old equipment. So there's these assumptions made 
that things will just work as they should be because people are on newer equipment, right? And that's a fallacy. And so can't stress enough that making sure that um, you're actually validating any kind of identity or credential that's asserting your identity, right? You need to be able to ensure that you're validating it. And if it's not valid, what do you do? Which also brings me to the point of when we're thinking about DNSSEC or RPKI, right? You're relying on digital certificates. You're relying on, on uh, an entity or somebody to purport that something's valid or invalid. But what are you doing when something is denoted as being invalid? Right, initially people are doing nothing because they don't wanna be wrong. And I understand that, but we need to start to act on things that are invalid, learn from the experiences and then keep improving. So to me, security must start taking precedence and we will only get better over time as we make some mistakes and then learn. The problem of course comes in is that any application we build, any device that we buy, there are trade-offs made between convenience, security and privacy. You cannot have all three all the time, right? It is nearly impossible. But what you need to do is make a conscientious choice for what are you building your application or your device for? What are the requirements for um, the pr uh, majority of your users? And then also clearly, clearly articulate what are the defaults? What is the default behavior? So if somebody wants to change that default, they can do that in an informed manner. People do love defaults. Jeff was saying that from a routing context, right? I think in anything um, digital, right? People don't want to have to change the default because that means more work. That means when you're upgrading something, you have to remember what you changed, right? Defaults, you just want to plug it in and have it work. But you need to understand what the defaults are. And the one example that I will bring forth is, um, just nobody wanted to think about how cryptography worked. They didn't care about SSL, TLS, it just worked. And then you had Heartbleed, right? Five or six years ago, which was a major implementation flaw. And all of a sudden people realized that, wow, I, I do have to understand how this works, right? Shellshock Poodle. I mean, people had to understand what were the crypto cryptographic algorithms that were used because some of them were old, they were insecure, and you really had to change from what the vendors had as defaults. So we can't just have blind trust in these defaults and how equipment and application works and how secure they are. We do need to have, to have more of an understanding and ask, well, how does this actually work? And so when we look at the work from home scenarios, right? One of the aspects right now is that there are no more private networks. You're at home, you might be sharing the same network with uh, your spouse, um, your, your significant other, your children. What are all the devices that are on the network? Now, with all the devices that are on the network, it could be your television, it could be you know, iPads, it could be you know, a bunch of mobile phones. Where's the data going? Who can see the data? And what is done to protect the data, right? Now you have critical work-related data along with all these other devices on the network. And where, what's going on? Like who can actually potentially view something that might be confidential? What credential is used to log into data? Or, or access various devices, especially if you're remote. Is anybody looking at whether or not there's any unauthorized access? 
And one of my biggest pet peeves, or you know, it's something that I I I I am worried about, is that so many people, because they're homebound, want to share things. They want to share what they're doing online. They take screenshots of them with their computers. Well, is your password shown anywhere? There are applications that don't X out when you're typing in a password. Some of them actually just show them in clear text. So I've seen screenshots with people with their computers and you've got a password there on the screen, right? Quite insecure and who knows who's gonna be seeing it, especially if it's on social media. And also what is seen on a screen share? Um, I was in a meeting a couple of days ago where different messages popped up or a chat screen popped up. Now it wasn't anything that was confidential, but a little bit embarrassing maybe for somebody. And so we have to be more cognizant in terms of what you were sharing. And I always say, we need to get back to the basics. I hear a lot about how sophisticated attacks how are, how there's nothing that we can do. And then I always say the word Mirai. Right. Mirai, a very large scale attack. Why was it successful? And what vulnerabilities did it exploit? Default passwords and Telnet. Right. No equipment should have Telnet on by default. Actually, no equipment, to my thinking, should have Telnet at all. And default passwords absolutely should not exist in this day and age. So, you know, these are some very simple things where some most basic security hygiene can minimize the impact of sophisticated attacks. And so really we have to get back to the basics and really think about how are we authenticating users? What, is, what are the credentials that are used? How could somebody impersonate uh, that credential or, you know, uh, use it um, in an unauthorized manner? And then what controls do we have in place to, to mitigate that? Um, also, I always talk about auditing and logging because we don't look at logs enough. We have reams and reams and reams of data, but I don't think people are effectively looking at anomalies in their logs that could give them some kind of uh, uh, indication that something nefarious might be going on. So what's very, very important is to try and get alerted for unauthorized changes to anything. And this is true for uh, DNS related issues, for routing related issues, for folks that are trying to get access to equipment. And so at a bare minimum, right, I look at those three aspects. And so the key is really that you wanna avoid surprises. And I always harken back to uh, trust but verify because I, I don't like the term zero trust because to me, that means that you never trust anything, right? I wanna start with trust, but I wanna have verification and periodic verification that what I'm trusting is actually solid. And so absolutely you wanna employ measures to detect any kind of compromised uh, credentials and look at your logs, build tools to make looking at logs easier, right? Define specific criteria for what you're looking at. Um, as I was installing my new root certificates um, the other day, I was wondering, you know, do I need all of these root certificates? And I got rid of some of them, right? Now, that's not something a layman's going to do, but it made me think how many technical people who are DNS gurus, BGP gurus, you know, whatever experts in, in whatever their field is, do they actually ever look at what root certificates are in their devices and prune them? And I would think probably not. And so, you know, how do you know that they're valid or not? Um, we want to get better at making impersonation, digital impersonation difficult through solid identity validation processes and practices. That is absolutely critical. We also wanna make sure that we test our backups, right? How are they done? Um, how are uh, credentials stored, right? If you're having credentials or private information, confidential information in backups, um, 
is a kept confidential. And cloud storage is specifically important here. I think there's been a number of breaches where um, the information that was expected to be confidential maybe wasn't. And also if you're using mobile devices, which many more people are when they're, when they're at home, um, know what is backed up, right? Where and how. And then of course, when an incident happens, what do you do? Right? At a bare minimum, even if you're a small company, if you're new to having a lot of workers uh, be at home, especially layman workers who may not be so tech savvy, right? everybody has to know that if they think there's some kind of an incident, who do you contact? And also know who has authority for what decisions. And of course, very critical is also having some predefined actions for when an incident happens so that you can mitigate very quickly. And thank you to APNIC for what it did about half an hour ago. So again, these are just some pointers to help us try and be more aware and keep our digital um, work, life, play environments a little bit more secure. And um, any questions? Thank you so much, Mareke. I would like to ask Tidi Pong uh, to ask a question. Um, can you uh, sp uh, say your full name and where you're uh, calling in from, please? Tidi Pong, are you there? I think we're having some issues there. Is there anyone else who'd like to ask a question? Nope, all right. Well, uh, how about we go back to Willa um, for the next speaker? Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mary Kay, for that insightful session. Now, our next speaker is a network engineer from Cloudflare, and he'll be discussing on optimal route reflection and optimizations for any cast routing. Please welcome Tom Paseca. Hi, everyone. Thank you for having me this morning or this evening or afternoon, wherever you are in the world. Um, it's always a lot of pressure to go behind such uh, distinguished speakers like Jeff and Mary Kay, um, but I'm looking forward to it. So. Today, I want to talk about BGP or, or what? Um, optimal route reflection and optimizations for any cast routing. Um, so BGP um, is what this talk is about. Um, I'm not going to give a seminar on this um, as obviously we don't have time for, for it in a 15 minute presentation, um, but all of you should know something about BGP already, um, especially about IBGP you may be aware that there are some rules um, in how routes can propagate through an IBGP network. One example is that an IBGP route won't be shared between IBGP neighbors. Um, so there's some things you need to do to, to solve this. Um, two, two options, one is a full mesh network where you actually set up a BGP session between every single one of your routers. Um, this is obviously quite difficult to do um, as you scale a network very large um, and you have to have an enormous number of sessions. If you miss a, a session as well, you might actually end up black holing traffic inside your network. Um, so a good solution for this is route reflectors. They're simple, quick to deploy and easily scalable because the number of sessions that you need to create um, is, is really just the number of, of routers times the number of route reflectors that you have in your network. So you might think route reflectors are the optimal choice to deploy. But what if I told you Full mesh is significantly better for routing. So thinking of a topology, um, this is a, an example network in Europe where they have three sites, Amsterdam, Frankfurt, and Paris. Um, they have two routers in each site and have interconnected them. They've decided to deploy a route reflector, but only in one city. So they've deployed a single route reflector in Frankfurt. Inside that, they run a service which is anycasted um, connected to a single route reflect, uh, sorry, a single router in each of the cities. And they have devices, they have end users connected throughout their network. Um, if you're thinking about this, 
how many will uh, how many devices will actually connect to the local DNS server? Um, you might think, oh, it's pretty simple design, but you'll actually realize that some of them won't connect to the, the local server because of how the route reflector works. You have some good paths there where the device is connected to the same router as the, the service they're connecting to. Um, and oddly enough, in the Frankfurt POP example here, all of the traffic is going to the correct destination. Um, but then you have these, these bad paths, which are actually also going to the Frankfurt POP for some reason. Why is this so? It's because of how the route reflectors actually work. When a route reflector disseminates its view um, of the network to every other router, it's actually telling you its view, not just the views that it's collected. It makes a routing decision based on how it can re reach that endpoint. Um, in this case, its view to the service in Frankfurt might only have a very small metric, whilst everywhere else has a much higher metric because it's actually using that route reflector's view. Well, does that mean both options are bad? Um, do you actually not have a good option for, for controlling your IBGP? But there is a, a better solution for this, and it's called BGP ORR, BGP Optimal Route Reflection. Um, it's, it's still in the draft stage, so it's not an RFC yet, but it's been around for quite a long time. Um, it was introduced in 2011, so it really isn't new at all. Um, and it has very wide support already, um, long existing support existing from both Juniper, Nokia, um, Cisco, and, and most major vendors. Um, to deploy it as well, you don't actually need to change uh, the software across your entire network. Um, you may only need to upgrade your route reflector if it's not already supported already. Um, and so doing that, you'll actually be able to end up having paths look like this, where you have hand traffic being handed off to the local um, service. Um, part of the way it's done is that you create a view for each of the um, route reflector groups that you want to create, sorry, the, the optimal route reflector groups. So that way you have an optimal exit point inside each of the, the clusters that you create. And this is still done with only a single route reflector. So you don't need to deploy multiple ones. Um, you just need to optimize how it, it shares that information. So why should you be doing this? Um, if you're like me and, and uh, grew up in Australia or uh, uh, have young children probably with Australian influence, you'll know the Wiggles. Um, and they're singing this song at the moment called Hot Potato, Hot Potato. Um, hot Potato Routing, also known as Closest Exit Routing, it's needed for modern routing infrastructure. Um, most major networks are designed like this with the exception of some holes in it, which OR can help solve. And it's really critical for any cast as well. Now, when you see this potato, it looks pretty sad. Um, I'd say that it's a cold potato. To demonstrate the difference between hot potato routing and cold potato routing, I've given these two diagrams here. Um, there's two ASNs, so two networks operating here, AS1 on the bottom, AS2 on the top. Um, the two networks are connected in many different places. Um, and their network looks fairly well optimized. But in the case of cold potato routing, you may have a user connected on the bottom right, be carried all the way across their own network before exiting. And that's a cold potato routing. You're, you're handing it over very slowly. But an optimal routing exit would look something more like that, where you have a hot potato. It's exiting at the first and closest exit. Um, so use cases. Why would you actually want to do this? Um, a lot of networks, especially these days, are starting to change their DNS infrastructure, um, the DNS resolving infrastructure. It, it's a pain to manage. Um, DNS stack is, is, is getting complicated for some people. Um, and so, so they, they really revamp their service. Um, in the US, I use Comcast here as my internet service provider. And they actually give an anycasted address for their DNS service inside their network, 75, 75, 75, 75. Um, but how do they make sure that traffic actually gets handed off to the local node? Um, another great example is, is actually Cloudflare, my own network. Um, our AS, AS1335, is nearly 100% anycasted for delivery. And this works really great until you get really close to the edges. Um, for, an, for example, I've got a network deployed in South Asia. Um, and I connect with a, a very large network across a dozen cities but they actually only hand traffic to me in three cities because of their, their um, BGP uh, route reflector design, um, which led me to, to research this and help them fix it as well. 
how do I implement BGP OR? Um, again, we don't really have time to go through a full configuration of how to do it um, in 15 minutes, but there are some uh, sample configuration guides here from uh, Cisco, from Juniper, from Nokia. You should be able to contact your vendor fairly easily and they should be able to give you some, some guidelines there. So in summary, BGP OR is not new. Um, it's been around for a very long time already. It's easy to implement, but there are some drawbacks because the route reflector needs to maintain much more information depending on the number of groups um, and, and routers you put into it. It's memory utilization will actually go up dramatically, um, but it allows you to better utilize network resources and you can even make the internet a little bit better. Thank you. Um, I'll open for any questions now. Thanks so much, Tom. Um, so questions and comments, please don't forget you can use the Q&A box for text or you can raise your hand uh, and you can ask the question yourself. And in the meantime, also don't be shy, take a photo of yourself networking from home and post it on Twitter with the hashtag NFH. So question from Jeff Houston, how many more years will it take to adorn B is that IBGP with knobs and whistles to make it a full blown IGP? <laughs> uh, that's a very good question, Jeff. I think many networks already do that today. Um, they, they may be only, sorry, let me, let me correct. They, they will often just do point to point addressing between their routers um, and have no IGP running underneath it except for IBGP. Um, so I think that is already a reality. We've got time for one more question. Uh, uh, anyone else? Here we go, Tashi. If we follow the physical typology of RR selection, shouldn't traffic path be optimal? That's a very good question. So if I go back to uh, this, which one? This one here. Um, in this case, um, you'll see there is a physical forwarding path which works in these sites because the, the service is directly attached to the same router as the user its local forwarding decision will work. Um, but in the case of um, the, the router next to it, it doesn't receive the route from that router because the route reflector makes its own decision, um, which says that this is the best exit point in Frankfurt and tells the, the router there to exit at that point. Um, so the, the router, which may only be a meter away or, or several meters away, will actually have the, the wrong routing information. Wonderful. Thank you so much, Tom. And thank you all of the speakers in the first session. We hope, uh, we hope that you have enjoyed uh, the first session. We're going to take a quick 10 minute break. Um, when we come back, we have brilliant presentations on automation framework testing and running a local copy of the DNS root zone, plus a great panel on uh, ISPs and how they're dealing with COVID-19. Please come back and join us for the second very strong half. See you soon.
Hello again, everyone. Welcome back to the Southeast Asian Networking from Home event. I'm Makito from KHNOC. Thank you for being with us. Coming up next is our second technical session with another two presentations. I hope you will enjoy it. Now we are pleased to invite Mr. Warwick Mitchell, the network architect from AARNet, the National Research and Education Network of Australia. Warwick has a background in various technical roles ranging from systems administration to network architecture across banking, defense, mining, and service providers in Australia. And today he will be sharing with us how to utilize tools and the robot framework to automate your test environment to repeatedly verify whether new versions of software or hardware comply with your service delivery and quality assurance expectations. Please help me in welcoming once again, Mr. Warwick Mitchell for the presentation of automation framework testing. Thank you for that wonderful introduction. Uh, hopefully you guys can see my screen and see the presentation. So I'll uh, move along. So I'm gonna be talking about automation framework and acceptance testing. And quite simply, it's a way to repeatably and reliably run tests or test suites against your network infrastructure. Again, ideally not in a lab, but, oh, sorry, not in a production network, but within your lab. Uh, and it allows you to rerun these tests 
and you can then report on the failures and successes and you can then focus purely on the failures so that you can actually start to narrow down what has actually gone on with your infrastructure. So moving that along, the beginning part of what I'm gonna talk about is to utilize Napalm. So Napalm uh, was written in Python. It's a fantastic uh, module that you can use within Python uh, to provide an API with an abstraction layer of how you interact with your network devices. And using Python and Napalm, you can use it to fetch data from various different devices, from Juniper, from Cisco, from Arista, and so forth, and get back the data from all three devices, but in a consistent, standardized fashion that you can then utilize for your automation processes and so forth. So moving this along, I'm going to show you an example here. So here you can actually see that we have uh, Napalm and I've called from the Python, within Python itself, I'm going, let's load the actual module and we're calling the get network driver. And that actually tells it, okay, I want to be able to talk to a device. And then with that, I'm defining here that I'm going to talk to a Junos type router. You can specify IOS or EOS and various different things. And then we're specifying, okay, I want to connect to this IP address with this username of admin, this password of Juniper with an exclamation mark. And then we're actually saying, okay, let's actually connect to the device. From there, we're then in this particular case, printing the command output of telling it we want to run the device with a ping command and we want to ping 10.0.0.2 and a repeat count of five. And what we get back is a dictionary, which is great, but it's really not fun to read as a human. So to make that a bit easier, we use pretty print, print and we load the module and we tell it that we want to indent so that everything is a little bit nicer. It's an indent of four spaces uh, so that it's a lot more readable. We rerun the same command and look, we're able to read that command output so much nicer. And basically this gives us the ability to see what is going on. And then we can actually pull apart the data in these packets to actually get an idea of what it is that we're actually able to pull from the device. So if you're a uh, service provider or a, uh, an enterprise or whatever, generally speaking, most of us run multi-vendor environments. And this is where this is really good because we can run this command from a Cisco, a Juniper, an Arista and so forth and be comfortable that we're going to be able to programmatically re reuse those responses. So another function is that you can use the device.cli or the CLI command function here and you can actually issue commands via Napalm to the device. Now, in this particular case, you'll notice that I've defined that the command is clear BGP neighbor all, but I've done it as a list. And that's due to the way in which Napalm actually interprets the command structures and returns the responses. You can define multiple lists within the command box. So you could do clear BGP neighbor all, then put a comma, and you could then put show BGP neighbor all, comma, show version, those sorts of things. And you can get all three of those commands back in the one command run. So that's actually really nifty and quite usable. Um, things to note is that Cisco doesn't give you a response to say that it actually cleared anything. It just simply drops you to a, a blank line to the next uh, command prompt. Whereas uh, the Juniper in this particular case actually responds saying, I cleared that session or cleared the number of sessions in this particular case. So with that in mind, there are a number of getters as they're called. Um, basically, there's somewhere in the vicinity of about 60 to 70 different getters that you can utilize and some work on iOS XR, some work on Juno, some don't. Um, this table that's in the documents actually is automatically generated each time they actually build Napalm. And you can use this to interrogate various different bits and pieces of the, your infrastructure, depending on what you're doing. So in this particular case, you know, we've got the get BGP neighbors or get BGP neighbors detail, and we can actually use that to get the data in a consistent way, which is really useful. So how does that tie in with the robot framework? So robot framework was originally developed by Nokia networks, uh, and it was open sourced in 2008. It's written in Python. It's a generic test automation framework. It has a whole bunch of uh, features and functionalities and ways you can manipulate it and do what you would like to do with it. 
Uh, in this particular case, the way to think of it is you define your, what your test data is, you define what it is you're going to, what is it you want to get? How do you, how are you going to make sure your test is going to work? Then you define, okay, well, the robot framework is needing to go and fetch that data. In this case, uh, it needs to fetch it via an API. Uh, I've written my own API, which I'll show you in a minute, uh, around the Napalm framework to interact with Robot to then return results in certain ways based on what I needed in my examples. And then you have test libraries which define what it is you want to run, and then you go through the tools and um, uh, you can then uh, run this against int uh, various different devices under your systems of test and you'll get your results. So let's take a little bit more of a look into that. So this is what a robot, uh, sorry, a dot robot file contains. Now I'll just be clear, there are multiple different ways you can write robot framework files, test cases. You can write them as tab spaced format, which is what I've done here, or you can write them as uh, you can use uh, Excel spreadsheets. You can use the ride function, which is part of uh, robot where you can define test cases. Uh, you can also use uh, pipes to delineate between what is certain areas of the test cases and so forth. So if we have a look at the top here, I've defined that the documentation is referring to what is the description? Well, I'm gonna run some router test cases. The library that I'm calling is the napalm is the router napalm.py module that I wrote, and I'll show you that in a moment. And then the first thing it's going to do is, as part of the test setup, it's going to go and connect to the device. And I'll refer to that in a minute when we get further down. There are some variables that get passed to certain sections of the uh, the rest of the testing framework. So in this particular case, p1 refers to the Juniper router that I want to connect to. Login is the username. Password is obviously the password to get onto the device. Then you have down underneath that, you have the keyword section, which refers to, in this particular case, we've defined a keyword here of connect device, which is referenced up in the test setup. And then we basically give it a name and we basically say this variable of napalm connection dash P1 is napalm connect. It's just a, uh, a keyword name and you, we then define that it's going to uh, connect to the P1 router, it's login, it's password. And then we define that this variable is going to now know, be known as napalm-connection equals PE1. And then under the test cases, we have a couple of different areas. We have the definition of what is the test name. So as you have multiple tests, you generally want to name them individually. So you would go with test 01, dot one, two, three, four, et cetera, depending on how you want to lay out your files. And then tags is a way of identifying, well, what is it that you're testing? So in this particular case, I'm testing, it's a router and can I ping? So I've given it the tags of router and ping. Then we go into the last step section, which is actually running the command. And that's where we, we have the variable of peer ping, peer underscore ping underscore state. And we tell it to run the keyword of ping neighbor to that device and we want to see the argument here is 192.168.1.55 and the result should be equal to the word successful and that's what we should get back in that variable so when we actually look at what's in router napalm.py it's fairly simple python um, we're basically importing the get network driver that i described at the beginning we're then importing this magic word, which is the keyword section. And the keyword here is used so that in the previous slide, you might notice the napalm connect and the ping neighbor. In the previous slide, they were these attributes down here and down here. And so we were able to reference those and that's what then calls that particular function into activation. So this particular case, it's gonna to connect to the device in the ping, it's going to take the attributes of we've defined what device and the ping, the peer we want to ping. And in this particular case, we then issue the ping against the device that we uh, have uh, listed as an argument previously. And then if the result returns, it has the word success in it, then we return successful, which matches what the attribute in the test is. And therefore we uh, actually say, yes, the test passed. If it doesn't pass, if it's unsuccessful, 
um, then it will return the results so that you can actually see if there was a non-valid result there. Um, so you can actually then get some data to go and look at it a bit further. So when robot doesn't work, when the, one of the tests fails, you see this sort of a report, it's red. When it does work, it's green. And in this particular case, you can see here that the reason it failed is that there was a section for router and alarms that failed. Now, if I go across to this, we can actually, and it's a bit hard to see on this, but you, you will be able to see it when you see the slides directly. It failed because the Juniper reported that the rescue configuration was not actually saved um, or set. And then because I tagged it as alarms and router, that's what generated those, area, those errors up above. And that gives you an idea of what you can do with it. So tying it all together, this is a virtual lab that I actually have in my home network uh, that I run on a Linux box. I have a couple of Cisco devices, another couple of Cisco devices, a couple of Juniper virtual MXs, and again, another virtual Cisco. And basically using those, I can emulate the test environment and actually run against them. So I have the following GitHub repository, which has the the test that I've just shown you, and it also has the actual full robot, uh, sorry, router napalm.py file in it for you if you want to have a look and play with it. And it shows you all the various different tests. Now, I've been running this test for the last few days prior to this event. Uh, every hour, I'm able to run the test four times an hour at 15 minutes because it takes seven, seven and a half minutes to run all the tests. So if you do the maths, that's roughly 96 tests per day. Um, and so you can see I've, I've actually run it for just over a week. And what's really interesting about it is you can see the passes and the failures in Jenkins. And Jenkins actually goes and fetches this from, uh, from Git every time. So it picks up all the changes. And you can see what I've made significant changes to the tests. And you can see where things have. The really interesting part here is that you can actually choose to only show the failed which is what we want to do to actually figure out what's going on here. So you can use this as a way of running your tests of what your known network state should be in your lab. You can then do a software upgrade and see whether or not the software worked the way you expected or did it introduce a new and different bug that you hadn't been expecting. You can use it to make sure that, you know, a new line card that you put in your, your router actually does do VPLS the way you're expecting and that packets flow. You can use it to test BFD functionality, timeouts, failures. You can even interact it with like Spirant and Ixia testers to actually generate packet flows through these devices and actually test you can push them at 100 gig and they don't fail packets and you can apply configs while this is happening and making sure this all works. So it's really quite a powerful tool that you can use to get a bit more of an idea about being comfortable that your network is going to perform the way you expect. And in terms of man hours, you can make sure that you can run these tests in your lab prior to you doing software upgrades and so forth and feel a lot more comfortable. So that's uh, it for my presentation and happy to take any questions if there are any. Thank you so much, Warwick. There's actually two already in the queue and I will encourage people if they'd like to ask a voice question, please raise their hand or ask a question in the Q&A. So first question from Tom Paseka. Have you considered using something like SaltStack to go with Napalm to make actions easier? Absolutely. Uh, yes, we have looked at doing that. Um, it was just a case of I was doing this for a demo and happy to, uh, to look at doing that if we wanted to take it further outside of the demonstrations for these sorts of presentations. But yes, absolutely, you could use SaltStack for that function. And a question from Mark Pryor. So is there a way not to use a username password pair and hard code it into a script? I believe the answer is yes. Again, I did that for simplicity, just to show what you could do and make it easier for a live demonstration. Sienna, do you want me to answer the other questions that have come up? Uh, can yes, can you, you can see it. Can you answer Brooke Schofield's question? Hard to read out that one. 
yes, I can. Uh, why in a lab rather than on your production network infrastructure? Um, in essence, when you're doing software testing before you put it on your production network, you want to make sure that you're doing it uh, where it's not going to impact your customers in case you do find a bug. That being said, you can still use the Napalm functionality and robot to actually pull data from your network and store it for pre and post maintenances. So you can use it for both, but um, again, it depends on your situation as to what you want to use it for. In this particular example, I was using it for showing if you're doing software updates and making sure that you were not going to impact production while you were testing it. That would be why I'd use it in a lab, not production. Uh, where can I find the robot, the network robot framework example? Uh, you can find it if you just Google for robot framework. There's not a lot of examples that you'll find for utilizing it with Napalm, um, but uh, if you go to the GitHub repository that I put in the slides, which I'll, um, which will be sent around later, or be it, you'll be able to access, there'll be a link that you can then go and see uh, how I've achieved it and go from there. Uh, what about devices discovery? Um, it depends on what it is you're trying to do. Do you have a bit more of an explanation as to what you're trying to uh, achieve? You've said it's auto or add some. Do you mean, do I have to manually define them? The answer is in the testing, yes. You have to manually define what you want to actually connect to. Brilliant, thank you so much, Warwick. Um, I'm gonna hand back over to Makito unless there are any other questions. Uh, uh, there is actually one in the chat. We'll quickly read that out. What are the pitfalls in using Napalm, Napalm and robot in production? Again, the pitfalls here is that it depends on what you're trying to use it for. If you're just using it to fetch data to see how things are working on a day-by-day -day basis, no issues. If you're using it to clear BGP sessions like I was doing in the example uh, that is on the GitHub page, then you're actually resetting everyone's BGP sessions. So that would be bad in doing that in a, uh, a production environment. But again, it all depends on how you've written your tests as to what it is you want to achieve. And if you've written your tests in a way that you can achieve that on your production network and you feel confident in doing that, then that's up to you. Uh, but again, hindsight from many years of experience in the industry is that I tend to try and do things in a lab as much as possible to avoid potential impact on the production network where possible. Thank you so much. Back to Makito. Thank you, Warwick, for the nice presentation. And thanks to everyone for your questions. Next, we are delighted to invite our next speaker, Mr. Swepnil Panika, Managing Director of Shrestha IT Technologies Private Limited from India. Swepnil is a network engineer, developer, researcher with interest in Unix systems, network, and security. He has more than 15 years experience in networking and security. Now I would like to give the floor to Swepnil for sharing his view on the resiliency and the security of the domain name system. And he will demonstrate an interesting project of running a local copy of the DNS root zone during his presentation. Swepnil. Thank you, Makito. Hello, everyone. Um, good morning, good afternoon, good evening, wherever you are in the part of the world. So uh, I'm going to... Uh, uh, talk about uh, hyperlocal root and running a copy of uh, a local copy of the DNS root zone. Let me just skip this part of it. So uh, let me summarize the current state of uh, the DNS uh, root server infrastructure. Uh, to begin with, uh, one of the key elements is the access time, which is the route trip time to the root servers. And this is primarily dependent on multiple factors, one being uh, Availability of a root server primarily uh, in the country. Uh, second would be optimal routing. And I think that is something that probably I will share in the, in the next uh, couple of slides uh, for that matter. The other element is uh, from a privacy perspective is, is uh, the transactions or the communication between the, the, root, the recursive resolver and the root servers is not encrypted. Of course, uh, uh, there have been efforts uh, with regards to encrypting the communication between the, the client and the recursive resolver by means of DOT as well as DOH. But the recursive to the root is, is, is in the open. Right? From a resiliency as well as uh, availability perspective, uh, 
one of the um, you know models that is typically uh, that has been typically used from a root server perspective is root server infrastructure perspective is is, uh, is IP anycast for that matter. And so as of now, there are you know uh, twelve root server operators and one thousand eighty four instances of uh, the root servers in various parts of the world. So one of the questions is how do we increase uh, the resiliency of the uh, root server system uh, to something like a denial of service attack? And uh, a common um, example that comes to mind is Dyn, the attack on Dyn that happened on 2016, I believe. And a more broader uh, a question that I have is, uh, since the root server uh, infrastructure does not penalize abuse, uh, should we continue abusing it? And that is uh, a question, you know, probably I'll come to it a little later as well. Uh, so here is a study uh, done by ICANN uh, uh, in April 2020. Uh, so they did a study with regards to traffic patterns to the root server uh, instances. So ICANN, as you may already know, runs the L route and uh, or manages the L route uh, instance, uh, the, the infrastructure there. And uh, what they also did was from a traffic perspective, they looked at uh, the kind of traffic that was hitting uh, during COVID-19, uh, especially. Uh, one of the things that they, uh, and they just to um, simplify this a bit. So IM, IMRS stands for ICANN Managed Root Server. So that's the L root uh, for that matter. So one of the things that uh, uh, came as an observation from that study is primarily that the number of queries that uh, basically hit the root server, uh, which are non-existent, right? And uh, to uh, summarize uh, the entire study in, in a short span of time, one of the key observations here has been uh, uh, usage of something like you know Google Chrome uh, people working from home accessing uh, the internet started using uh, Chromium based browsers and the number of uh, queries that basically originate from Google Chromium uh, is is uh, uh, for a non-existent domain. So what typically happens is, so when you boot uh, a Chromium based browser on, on startup, it sends uh, queries to non-existent domains which are basically 7 to 15 characters long and these are uh, random strings. So these are typically junk queries that are hitting the root server. They, they also found out that there is a significant increase in queries from no, other non-existing domains in uh, the other TLDs like .corp, .local, and .home used by various uh, applications as, as well as operating systems for that matter. So the paper is, is by the uh, ICANN Office of the CTO that is uh, an, an analysis of effects of COVID-19 related lockdowns. I have a link on the presentation at the very end. So I highly recommend that you look at that paper as well. Here is, uh, uh, from, from a access to the root perspective, here is a tracer out from AS9498 to, uh, to the iRoot server. So the iRoot server uh, is managed by uh, the root, root server operator NetNod. And if you look at the tracer out, uh, you can see that uh, the traffic is basically transiting outside of India. Uh, however, having said that, there is an Anycast node in, in Mumbai, uh, with, which is basically accessible by IPv4. Here is another example of a trace route where, um, and I'm not picking primarily just AS 9498, uh, just to uh, give this as an example. So a trace route from uh, AS 9498 to the K root server, which is uh, the root server operator is uh, RIPE NCC. You again see that the, the traffic uh, is, is transiting outside of India. So enter uh, something like uh, RFC 7706, which is a decreasing access time to root servers by running one on the loop pack. So the RFC basically, just to summarize uh, uh, what it says is, uh, DNS resolver operators who want to uh, prevent snooping of the queries that are uh, being sent to the root, uh, decrease the access time, that is a round trip time to the root servers. Uh, faster negative responses uh, to the sub resolver queries, uh, that is eliminate the junk to the root, uh, increase the resiliency of the root server system. So uh, typically, uh, instead of all, all uh, uh, queries beginning at the root, uh, if, if it can be done locally, right. And the other uh, perspective is to hide the queries to the root and to a very large extent, this has been uh, taken care of by other other means by using something like QNAME minimization, which is basically 
uh, making sure that the roots uh, or the root server system does not see the full query uh, to begin with, right? So what it means uh, from an implementation perspective is run an up-to-date uh, root server uh, on the loopback. So it is the same uh, host as the recursive and the recursive resolver uses this as the upstream. So all the communication between the recursive uh, resolver and, and the uh, one which is running on the loopback is uh, validated using DNSSEC. Here is a list of DNS uh, root servers which uh, support uh, AXFR, uh, that is uh, zone transfers. And we are talking about the root zone here to be very specific. Uh, uh, and if you look at this list, uh, there is no confirmation that it, it would remain the same because there is no uh, policy or there is no proposal which says that these root server operators have to uh, support uh, AXFR of the root zone. So one way you can do this manually at this point of time is by using something like a dig command on um, let's say the F root server and you would see that the, the root zone will show up on, on your screen. Uh, another thing that uh, has recently um, uh, been available in the open source DNS resolver software, especially in, in case of bind, that is version 9.13.3 onwards, is the um, configuration of configuring the, the root zone directly into the bind configuration. Uh, having said that, uh, I stumbled upon a very interesting uh, project called as Local Root, uh, and uh, this project is is uh, maintained by uh, Wes Hardiker uh, from the University of Southern California. So the basic idea is 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 the same: uh, is to uh, load a local copy of the root zone on uh, a resolver or on on the on the loopback, and having your local resolver use use it as an upstream. Um, but having said that, it is not equal to RFC 7706. And the reason for that being uh, primarily uh, the fact that uh, 7706 mentions specifically against uh, AXFR uh, in a slave configuration for that matter. So local up-to-date uh, copy of the root zone available on the recursive. The root data is DNSSEC signed and is, and is basically cached. So the transfer uh, is using TSIC. Uh, configuration available for bind, unbound, as well as NSD, and um, ideally uh, speeds up DNS resolution. Uh, so let's run a root server from home. So I, I would have, um, I would have loved to uh, do a, a hands-on demo per se, but uh, maybe the demo guards might not be with me. So what I have instead is basically screenshots. So the project is very simple. You go on the website local root, and you create an account, and uh, there is an option to generate a TSIC key. Uh, so once you generate a TSIC key, you basically uh, uh, create something called as a server. Uh, when, I, when you create the server, you basically add details of the IP address where you will be running this, uh, this instance, say for example. And uh, once you do that, what, it, uh, what the configuration generator throws out is basically a, a, a configuration which you can integrate into your, uh, into your DNS software. And uh, that's how the, the transfers would ideally work. Now, what can go wrong with regards to this uh, configuration uh, or, or more specifically RFC 7706 is uh, there is an added element of, uh, of, uh, of things breaking down from a DNS infrastructure perspective. Uh, if the content of the root zone cannot be refreshed within the expiry time, the server must return a surf fail for all queries. So this is the, the recommended approach of uh, the RFC as well. Here are the uh, references for uh, the various, uh, uh, the study as well as the RFC and the project. Uh, and I would be happy to answer any questions. Thank you so much, Swapneil. Uh, questions from anyone either um, by voice, by raising your hand or in the Q&A and I'll read that out for you. And in the meantime, why don't you take a photo of yourself that working from home <laughs> and uh, upload it to Twitter with the hashtag NFH uh, because there's some t-shirts for, for um, brilliant prizes. Um, we know that you want one. Uh, look, someone's done it, I can see in the chat. 
Well, if there aren't any questions, I will say thank you again to Swap Neil. Very good presentation. Um, I'd like to now um, shortly ask AFTAB to take the reins in the panel discussion. As you may be aware, um, the panel discussion is on how ISPs are dealing with COVID-19. Mm -hmm. um, and we have uh, four for presenters um, in this. There will be a lot of opportunities, I understand, for questions and comments, so please get them ready. Um, and, oh, we actually do have a question from Eric up here. How scalable is this proposal? What if millions of machines are now doing AXF slash IXFR instead of lookups? What we'll do, Eric, is send that question um, off to Swapneil um, because he's actually just logged off. Um, but great question and thank you very much. So I'm gonna hand over now to Aftab. Take it away, Aftab. Hello, everyone. I hope you can hear me loud and clear. Um, and uh, thank you, Sienna, for handing it over to me. So, um, uh, so far so good. It's an amazing session starting with, uh, I mean, what can possibly go wrong when Jeff Hughes starts the session for you? Uh, so that was, uh, again, uh, once again, an eye opener. And I put it on the chat. I'm, I'm taking bets that we will be uh, down to 920K uh, V4 prefixes before uh, 24 months. So if anyone is interested in those bets, um, I'm all open for that. But anyway, here we're going to discuss something very different. Um, I mean, it's not news to anyone that uh, we are dealing with uh, the COVID-19 situation. Um, but to discuss that with uh, some of our folks um, uh, from the region, which is the Southeast Asia region, I've invited a uh, few folks who are running the uh, infrastructure um, uh, and dealing with all these uh, problems, uh, the network uh, infrastructure or, or the um, IX uh, they are facing. So the, the topic is how ISPs are dealing with the uh, COVID-19 situation. Before I have a three page slide deck I'm gonna share with you just to show some statistics before going into that one. I need, I would like uh, my panelists to introduce themselves in 15 seconds. Your time starts okay. now. First one is Achi. Hi, I'm Achi from Globe Telecom in the Philippines. I'm also very active in uh, PageNog and internet, internet Society. Yeah. That's perfect intro. Uh, thank you, Dex in Kitinan. Yes, hello everyone. I'm Nan from uh, BKNX uh, and Eden Asian in Bangkok, Thailand. Good to join. Thank you. Thank you, Nan. Uh, next on my screen is Mark Chen. Mark. Hi, everyone. Uh, I'm Mark Chen. Uh, I'm the VP of Engineering in uh, my Republic, a Singapore ISP, in, and also Australia, New Zealand. Uh, happy to join you guys. Thank you, Mark. And next, I have uh, uh, Ms. Kind from a beautiful background of Myanmar. So my name is Dany Kaim. I'm from Myanmar Internet 18 MMI. So thank you so much. Uh, thank you so much. So uh, let me, okay. Sometimes it's challenging to start sharing your screen. Let me see if I don't make the mistake. Uh, um, here you go. All uh, right. Okay. I hope I'm sharing the right screen, not the uh, presenter view. Uh, if somebody else seeing a different thing, please shout out because all of a sudden my chat is missing from my screens. Uh, but anyway, I'm just going to go ahead with something, which is uh, here. Um, it's just introduction. Um, uh, we heard one thing quite uh, often uh, during February and March, earlier March, that um, everybody working from home is going to break the internet somehow. Um, luckily, nothing happened. Everything worked fine. Uh, but behind those, everything worked fine. Uh, situation. There were a lot of people uh, spending a lot of hours, uh, probably sometimes in the data center or sometimes uh, at night in front of their screen, trying to make sure that everything is working fine. Um, so here are some of the statistics. Um, thankfully, uh, to all my panelists, they shared it with me. Uh, so if you look at so with with Thailand PKNX, uh, uh, Philippines PHOPNOGS, Cambodia CNX, Singapore SGIX. 
um, they they all sh are showing um, increase in traffic. Some are showing more, some are showing less. Um, and it's not just four of them. Then we have Myanmar IX, uh, another big jump, uh, around four uh, gigs of that. And Indonesia IAX, uh, uh, it's another big jump uh, going along. And, uh, and another interesting uh, slide shared by Ketanan from the uh, BKNX uh, is they were recording uh, the, the rise in uh, traffic percentages um, in every month. So of course they'll be, uh, so Ketanan will be sharing more details. But now I, what I'll do, I'll just um, stop sharing because this is, I just wanted to show uh, the slide decks are um, actually available um, on, uh, on the, on the web NFH. Uh, so if you if you want to see the details, you can. Now in the same round robin manner, I'll start asking questions. Uh, so first question uh, to um, Achi is, you saw an increase in bandwidth uh, in PH open IX. It's not like the you 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 were witnessing that one, um, but also you're part of a uh, one of the largest ISP in in. Uh, Philippines. What was the impact of that on your network? I mean, uh, we understand uh, that all networks are usually work on the basis of uh, contention ratio. So you're you're able to absorb that much uh, increase in traffic, or you were struggling, or the IX was struggling. So how was the situation? Hi. So I did a kind of research and asked around with other. Uh, Try so we can more or less have a consolidated view of, of Philippines in a way. So basically, uh, yeah, you mentioned that if we didn't break the internet, uh, you first you have to define what break means. But uh, successfully, I mean, the network actually held out. Uh, there has been challenges in the surge in traffic. We see spikes like in PH Open IX, we it spiked from 60G. 200 Gs, uh, that's around 40 gig of traffic in, uh, in, in one day. So, I mean, uh, good thing the network pro was provisioned in such a way that it can handle the, the spikes. And uh, in a way, we have been kind of slow in terms of augmenting capacities brought about by we have quarantine rules, lockdowns. But uh, at the end of the day, we were able to more or less accommodate uh, growing traffic, and and as of now, it's it's more of a business as, as usual um, engagement for most of the ISPs in the Philippines. Okay, uh, I mean, forty gig jump is a big jump by any standards for for an IX. So that's an interesting one. So next one is uh, none. Um, I I I really like the. Uh, percentage you are recording in terms of uh, um, um, every week and every month. Um, you also saw almost 40% uh, of spike in, in the traffic. Uh, so uh, uh, how how the IX coped with it and how the ISP is connected, your peers were coping with it? So since, since the first day that we realized that uh, the network is important for, for, for everyone since uh, they cannot go to work and uh, everyone should be online. So we we have, uh, as the internet exchange, we have to prepare that uh, the capacity and also uh, the connection on communication uh, has been prepared for uh, user and also uh, other ISP to that we can accommodate all the traffic uh, during that time. So, uh, what we have seen that uh, neighbor from home is uh, is used much the traffic in in, in the daytime, and what we we, we do we also uh, support the capacity and we reach out to the to every member that if you want to to increase the capacity we are happy to do that to ensure that uh, every online activity can can pass uh, even in the daytime or in the in the peak time so uh, one interesting uh, activity that we have seen is uh, is about the the online education that uh, they, they cannot go to the school that the digital learning is important and 
uh, most of the activity should be online. We have seen the, the jump traffic on the first way on the first day of, of education. It's like a spike in the in the 10 a.m. in the morning. Mm -hmm. uh, I think that is a, the, the the one event that we we can absorb the, the spike traffic or the huge traffic from 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 the content to the user. Mm -hmm. And good to good good to see that it can 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 support any activity and 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 underneath. Okay, that's that's that sounds good. So um, I mean, again, it's going with the same definition. Um, everything worked well uh, in terms of the internet services um, in 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 Thailand or Bangkok uh, for the BK BKNX. So, Miss Kain, um, four gig jump doesn't seems like a big one, but if you look at it in terms of uh, the total traffic, um, MMIX is a new IX is, is, is coming up very strongly in, uh, in the country, but coming up from 10G to 15 or uh, some closer to 15G is a big jump. So yeah. what was that all um, happening? It's like new peer joining in or the existing peer uh, taking more and more bandwidth? No, no, we do not have a new member, but we have a, a new CDN. But uh, traffic jump is more than CDN traffic. So the uh, MMI is also jumping around about 30 to 40 percent. When I check with our IIS, ISP, they also respond that uh, the traffic jump is around about 30 percent. So the, all over the Myanmar, a uh, traffic is jumping. We noticed that. Okay, so it's more and more people using the internet because they cannot. Yes, go out, definitely. So, yes. Okay. Yeah. So the 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 next question to you is Mark. I mean, uh, my republic is quite known to uh, uh, having um, massive amount of the subscribers, and uh, both in Singapore and Australia, and New Zealand as well. Um, how did you manage to handle and up? rise in traffic and uh, all of a sudden it was jumping to multiple gigs rather than what you were used to facing in the new normal days. Uh, so uh, for Singapore wise, we have Ember headroom. So we are basically um, digging into the history and the buffer we have created for a very long time. Um, and we start to think about creative ways because Singapore MBN is actually a fiber, top fiber infrastructure. So we start doing passive point to point with switches, using OEM, using color optics, everything. Whatever we can do, we turn up as much as possible. Um, that helped. Uh, one of the things that we observe is for Singapore is actually that while the daytime do rises, the nighttime is still the peak. Right. So the nighttime rise peak in comparison is about 10 to 20 percent versus the daytime rises, which is almost double. Right. And um, you, you basically for us as an eyeball market, which is a very consumer focus uh, in the daytime, we used to have only 30 percent of network utilization or even low. Right. All of a sudden it's almost the same as the night. Right? It's very even just a small peak. In there. Um, we managed to get successful on it. And one some of the difficulty we met is of course, um, when we were trying to deploy new hardware, we were trying to do all this stuff when the uh, lockdown is happening, when the curve is happening. Um, what we met with is yes, a telco is an essential service. We were ordered to purchase all the items, um, but the fabrication plan by the vendors are not. So we, we find it very hard to, to obtain the items. Um, and on the other side wise, I have the unfortunate and fortunate time that I have outage during this event, um, which we noticed that um, for places like Australia, which I also operate in, um, the dark fiber outage now recovers way faster, right? Because there is, there is no one on the streets. There is a very fast recovery speed when there's a fiber cut, when there's an overhead fiber that is coming. Uh, for Singapore wise, um, the dark fiber MBN outage basically dropped to almost zero, right? Because there's no more construction works. Right? And 
Uh, however, when there is a hardware failure that we have recently experienced, when we try to assess the site, we find it very hard to go in. We have to prep our guys, uh, wear the protective gears and everything. Uh, it takes more time to prepare that than to actually prepare the spare hardware. Yeah. Yeah. So that um, brings me to a second question. So um, a uh, I'll start with you, Mark. So most of the people in, in Singapore who are working from home, even the NetOps people, I mean, network operations usually is 24 by seven. So you were relying on people uh, working from home 24 by seven? Uh, yes, we are relying on people uh, 24 by seven. Uh, we have learned from some of the past experience before. So we, our NetOps itself does have a requirement of two vendor broadband internet at home so that at least you don't run on your same network that you may it may affect the way you have outage. Um, so that is a policy that we have. Uh, all of them has been all remote working since the February because of uh, the size of our company, we have quite a thing operating model. So we have very low amount of NOC people. So at the start of February, we already kicked in that everyone is distributed in homes, uh, no one is working in the office. Uh, our network engineers are also doing the same. Uh, I have not seen office for a few months already. <laughs> That's not bad for some time, I guess. Uh, so I'll, I'll, come, <laughs> yes, I'll, come, I'll come to Archie. Archie, so <clears throat> um, today you're working from home for sure. Um, so how was it in, in the, in the worst of the lockdown? So, you know, everybody was working from home from, for, for the operations team as well. Uh, so this is a more holistic answer. So, um, initially there was this, uh, 50, 50 thing that you need to put, uh, skeletal force in the office and more, more half is go, going home. And then eventually, uh, there was this a uh, consolidated uh, agreement that most will be working from home. So it's only the really essential people who need to stay in, in the office. So it's more of a safety precaution for everyone. And uh, that was mainly brought about by the current cases being rising. We're still figuring out how to address the concerns. So, I mean, it was uh, more or less an idea that uh, we need to protect these people and because internet is very essential. So I mean, now, now's the time that people really you know, appreciate it very much because it became vital. And uh, in terms of uh, a work in progress, uh, we it started to more or less uh, get people go to the office. Uh, yesterday, actually, um, we were on a lighter version of lockdown. So that means uh, some guys can actually go, go to work. And uh, for some reason, I mean, given this two months or two, three months thing, we kind of got used to working from home and it in a way became, I should say more efficient uh, in, in managing time and everything. It's just uh, maybe less of the, the meetings and more of the stuff we really need to do. How good it is, less meetings, more work. So, <laughs> yeah, but the, but the social meeting factor was missing uh, from all the, uh, for everything. But so now, um, Bangkok uh, was in a very serious lockdown at some point. So, uh, but still, uh, again, the ISPs and the IXPs and the network engineers, they are considered as uh, essential workers all across the globe. So how was the situation in Thailand? What's, what's happening? People were working on from home or uh, they were doing 50-50 or 30-70 or something like that? So uh, at the very beginning, uh, I have to ensure that uh, when we have the lockdown, uh, everything that we need to assess like uh, equipment or spare part or even people uh, they have to to accessible all the time so uh, when, when we have the strict lockdown in in, in some place that uh, they tend to be closed so we have to remove some something out i have to ensure that uh, everything is accessible that's the term of the equipment or the the thing or tools or material so that is the first that we concern so uh, the second is the uh, people, mm -hmm. our knock team and our staff, 
So uh, most of our work, like uh, develop something, uh, uh, engineering can be done online. So we like uh, develop it more, more to, to, to more proper working in online. So I think that uh, in, in, in Thailand, we, we have success, successfully locked down that that quite 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 work for 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 control the the the, the situation but yeah in terms of network mm -hmm. uh even uh, travel restriction we have to to uh, overcome that problem so we have to to have a countermeasure of prepared it in place mm -hmm. that's it we do i think most of the network kind of do something like this in thailand okay that sounds good uh miss kai uh, yes. Myanmar, um, people working from home or uh, they were okay to go to uh, their ISP's office or the NOX uh, just because they were essential uh, workers? Yes, but it is not uh, uh, the same uh, in the organization. Some organization, uh, they are doing 50-50, some are 70-30. Uh, some organization, uh, uh, most of the operation they are doing from home. Uh, so just an essential person who need to assess physically, they are attending the office. So it depends on the organization and management they are doing. So Myanmar, we do not have a widely locked down, just uh, some area like a uh, same building, same street, they are doing lockdown. So the, we do not have a big problem, even they are attending to the office, it's okay, but majority are working, working from their home. But nowadays, some organizations, they are asking all the staff to attend office like uh, regularly. So during the period, uh, even we do not have a lockdown for the white area, but uh, uh, city to city, city base, uh, uh, they are doing Restric restriction traveling from the, uh, uh, from the other city to another city. So let's say for Mandalay, if a, someone from the Yango arrived to the Mandalay, they need to go the quarantine for, for 21 days. So it's a very difficult to assess the remote area. So some ISP, they could not send uh, the technical team to their far remote area. So two reasons. One reason is uh, no long distance uh, pass transportation. And then uh, even though they can use the transportation themselves, but uh, arriving to the another area, they need to go to, uh, enter to the quarantine center. So that is impossible. So in that case, they have to uh, depend on the local, local people. Uh, maybe these local people are very, low scale, but uh, have to instruct remotely. So that kind of problem we have. So people came up with the smart options and, uh, and solutions to uh, circumvent all these problems. So um, uh, on the same note, uh, Mark, uh, it makes a lot of sense that the North, North guys or the network operations team, even they are 24 by seven, they can, uh, they can access the devices or the network from, uh, from their homes. But how do you deal with the customer support? I mean, people are still gonna call and call has to land in the office. So diverting all the calls to people working from home, uh, how was that experience um, uh, running such a large um, uh, consumer focused uh, ISP? Uh, how, how did you deal with it? Um, so from the very start, our call center itself is using SIP because we are a relatively young company. So we do have the capability from day one to distribute all our call center stuff, right? Uh, what we observe the difficulty is managing the people rather than, especially the initial stuff, right? Um, uh, what, um, the network wise, what we have observed is also because we are now distributing them out. Uh, we used to thought that uh, using uh, as IPsec, firewall gateway is enough capacity for us. Turnout is not enough. We start teaching everyone how to use 
put it to do public private keys right and and give them a 10 gig line to use because some like love to use youtube while they are using partnering um so that's some of the things that we have went through and um i think we are a bit more fortunate because we started late so our network and our call center is prepared from the day one as a seed phone as a seed phone setup so they basically just have to take up their phone and work right the locking information is there as long as there's ip connectivity everything works um and basically just teaching them how to do up the tunneling how to do up the, the secure tunneling and things um besides that wise um i guess on the human managed side is that we at the very start is as i mentioned that we have time issue people are not able to start work and set up properly and at the after about a month, we have another issue, which is people doesn't know when to stop work because it doesn't make a difference anymore. They, they, they start forgetting why it's lunchtime, why it's not lunchtime, everything. So it, it is a very unique situation that we are there. Yeah, so the, the biggest issue, I mean, I've been working from home for more than four years now, and uh, that is the biggest issue. Uh, there is no end time. You cannot sign off, right? So you sign off for lunch, you sign off for dinner sometimes. Uh, so, uh, Achi, um, again, the support, how the support, it's the, it's, uh, redirecting the SIP, uh, uh, is easy managing a uh, hundred people picking up the phones and how they're dealing with it. And it's, 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 it's a whole management of the custom support, how it works. It's everything. Uh, what do you think, um, how you or the PH open IX, uh, uh, I mean, uh, they were dealing with it. Well, first, uh, yeah, uh, uh, additional info on Mark's comments. So it's it's just break time, no lunch time, no dinner. Or it's just break time. So about about the support. So uh, I think uh, necessity is the mother of invention. So we actually notice and observe a lot of uh, new requests for home installations. This is uh, more for all ISPs in, in Philippines. And then they started working from home and then like these call centers wanted to get their guys in, in, in the, at, at home to get connected. And uh, the sad part is for those who actually were left in the office uh, during the start of the pandemic, they stayed in office. And I understand based on uh, collaborating with other uh, folks that uh, some of the companies actually uh, arrange um, comfortable lodging and uh, some packages for them to make it uh, easier to do their to do their job. So in a way, it became a more of a business as as usual. Uh, from the uh, in the beginning, they we started to see some surge in probably complaints, and at the same time, there's also a lot of installation requests because a lot of uh, people wanted to upgrade their connectivity at home. Other wanted a separate connection, so you know it, it, it's a mix of, of activities that happen to more or less support uh, offline or I mean online uh, connectivity that you're not in the office anymore. Oh, that's perfect. Okay, so just a quick round um, uh, with everyone before we go to the Q and A because I can see some questions uh, which uh, they're interesting enough so we can uh, discuss it here. Um, uh, Two points each, uh, a quick round, uh, none. Uh, so you saw an increase in number of complaints um, or they were just normal? Complaints could be, it could, a uh, number of issues. Uh, it, it could be, okay, I need to upgrade. Okay, how much traffic is that? I need to do this, I need to do that. It's just a number of issues, not just complaints. You're muted. So in terms of that, uh, actually we also uh, foresee the capacity of the member and also uh, recommend them to upgrade beforehand. And in terms of issue, uh, now I, I think I see less uh, the issue since the the uh, the accident or the fiber card is lower since uh, there is less car on the street on the street. So I think uh, most of the the the, the the incident on the IX is 
about the fiber cut or the, the physical circuit. So I think the good thing that, that uh, the city is quiet, so we have less uh, complaint. That's good. And in terms of capacity, like we mentioned before, we uh, ask every member if you want to upgrade, we can do that mm -hmm. for free for a certain period. Yep, and we have uh, some new member to connect that. Mm -hmm. That's the, the way that we do. Just adding a question to uh, the same one is, um, what what type of uh, traffic um, uh, you were, uh, so it's more of the content or the CDN traffic, uh, more uh, video content people were watching, uh, traffic going to the, uh, to the content caches, or it was uh, just, um, increase in overall traffic, nothing is specific to uh, uh, this question. I mean, more towards the IXs. So, none. Um, and then I'll go to Ms. Kain on that one. Okay, me first. So, yes. uh, what we uh, significantly see is uh, the traffic on the on the daytime is, I think, uh, growing uh, significantly in, 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 in the, the week after the lockdown. So for, for the night time and the peak time, I think, I see the slightly decrease on the other traffic since we have uh, the emergencies in the night. So I think uh, the activity on the night may be, may be lower. That, that caused the traffic decrease in the, in the night time. Mm -hmm. That's okay. it. So, Ms. Kai, uh, not two questions, quick one. Um, one is number of issues, uh, you saw an increase or decrease or they were uh, as normal. And second, what type of traffic was that? It's more uh, CDN or just an overall increase? So I, our IX is in major, majority traffic or CDN traffic. <laughs> so uh, traffic pattern, uh, we have a two peak die, two PM, we have a one big die. Another big die is 10 p.m. So 10, uh, after this COVID duration, uh, work from home duration, 10 p.m. big die is uh, higher than 2 p.m. big die. So traffic pattern is like that. Okay, and number of issues and complaints or anything like that? You saw uh, we have one time, uh, one time incidents, uh, cause of fiber problem of uh, the IB transit yes. problem that failing to the our CDN. At that day, uh, we have to assess physically assess to the data center, but uh, that that is not our problem, but our upstream problem. So uh, upstream or after upstream fix it. Is so everything so okay? And uh, the, we have to another issue is we have to upgrade one customer interface from one G to ten G. At that time, our staff need to assess to the data center and support to the customer. Okay. So now the question is to uh, to the uh, to to Mark, and then I'll come to Archie. Is um, if if you are uh, you, if you have consumers, if even you have a corporate office, uh, sometimes they complain, and you have to send someone, an engineer or support staff to their premises. How did that work out uh, in, in this situation, Mark? Um, I would say we will try to accommodate as much as possible. Uh, there is a lot of time where we met with a uh, consumer is much better. So we have a rule in Singapore, basically, that we have to prepare face mask and we, on the other hand, we also prepare face shield in advance. So for all site access, uh, for the past two weeks or three weeks, we have prepared face, face shield with the mask for entry. Uh, what we have difficulties on is the commercial side. Uh, a lot of times that um, the building management at the very start of the lockdown, uh, the security would think that because it's lockdown, there's very much no more work in the office, uh, sometimes the building management is not around to approve the access. And that's one of the difficulties. The second difficulty is that when we were hit with uh, Singapore, we were hit with a dormitory uh, workforce issue uh, where we have a cluster there. What we have experienced is while the customer is in the building is urgent, right? They want us to assess immediately. Uh, the building management does not allow us to Right. Because they say that 
they, they want to assess our risk to make sure that we can. So we were searching around and looking around every vendor possible. Uh, in fact, uh, I think on the industrial basis, uh, we've seen a lot of uh, training being done, whether to uh, even managery level to know how to do field work and then send them into the sites because they are not part of the dormitory workforce. So that's some of the things that we have experienced. Uh, and there's a lot of things that we have seen in the industry that's happening for the field work itself. Um, majority of the time, thankfully, is due to the stop of work itself, also lesser breakage, lesser outage, because there's lesser moves. Um, and because of that, the outage is much less frequent. Okay, that's perfect. I mean, it, because there were less outages, so that you don't have to send a lot of people out um, uh, in the field. So that's that's good. Actually, um, you are sending engineers to the premises, or um, they, you're trying uh, your level best to troubleshoot everything on the phone. Uh, there's uh, some level of uh, escalation. So first, you, you need to call. You, it it needs to be reported, right? So it needs to be logged, and then. Uh, on the scheduling on site, you know, customers, individuals became more forg forgiving because I mean they're aware of what's happening, and they know they know that we need to schedule this. There needs to be some proper equipment, and there needs to be some uh, distancing. And so I mean, it, it kind of worked out because uh, you know both parties are aware of, of the situation. And besides the troubleshooting and um, you know, restoration stuff. There were actually a lot of uh, installation requests. So those, the same, uh, needs to be scheduled uh, accordingly. And in okay. addition, I would like to also uh, give input about the traffic. So initially, it's, it's when, when, it, when the lockdown started, it was mostly uh, video streaming or social media traffic. And then, you know, it skyrocketed. And then maybe for some reason, uh, since most of the people are at home. They already watch all of the movies. They already watch all the feeds on their social media account. They started to do their own traffic. So uh, from localized traffic, some of the traffic actually went outside because it became eyeball, uh, eyeball to eyeball traffic. So the likes of you know uh, recording your own video, uploading your baking skills, and, and th those kind of stuff. And they they tend to try to find other movies to watch. So you know, be before that gets cash, it needs to go out first and then get back. So we see that pattern now. Maybe they, they already uh, watch all of the stuff on the network. And I'm, I'm not sure, but probably it will stay there for, for a very long period, even, we, even, even if we come out of the yeah. lockdown. Um, so um, one question asked by Paul is, um, uh, did any of you, saw, I, I mean, we see any um, uptick in the IPv6 traffic because Google reported that there, there was an increase in IPv6 traffic because most of the V6 is uh, at the consumer uh, end and, the, um, uh, and they were, everybody was consuming the internet from home. So it means more V6 traffic should be vis visible uh, to everyone. So what was the take? Anybody would like to take this question from there? Okay, I'll, I'll jump in first. Uh, I mean, not to be really proud about it, but you know, V6 became now more or less a VAU. So we kept on pushing and pushing, and eventually, you know, uh, people started using it. Uh, some ISPs are already deploying um, uh, V6, uh, double staff, and I think uh, because of that, we had some increase in usage, and uh, I hope that will continue. Okay, Mark, uh, you, you provide V6 connectivity to your uh, to households? Uh, so for my end wise, um, there is some difficulties in processing. So for our consumer side, we actually have not gave V6 yet. Uh, our business side was as when they request, we do give them. So we are a bit on the other way around where because everyone is not working from home, we basically don't see V6 traffic. <laughs> so the, the traffic basically uh, almost disappeared. Okay, okay. All right, so, and uh, again, um, one question from um, Eric um, to everyone. So did you face any increase? I mean, so you're facing an increase in attacks, uh, packet-based attack or DDoS or 
uh, even the hackers or the malicious actors were also on leave or locked out. So anyone, it's like it, 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 it was coming towards the ISPs or the, uh, the IXP peers or the IXP peers were just broadcasting MAC addresses, just leaking a lot of information or it was, uh, uh, it was just very calm and cool. Uh, you know, I didn't that. notice. Okay, so that okay, so MMIX didn't notice anything. Uh, uh, Beacon X, none. Any complaints coming out of your customers, your peers? Yes, I think it's it's lower because uh, um, most of engineers tend to not touch the router. That means uh, there is more stability in in the network. So. They, so the they, stability part is good, yeah. okay, because yeah. not many people were making changes. Uh, but the malicious actors were also taking a, a leave somehow. They, they were not attacking. Or... So, uh, yeah. So what I have observed is that, um, especially DDoS frequency wise, it drops uh, by a lot. And the few times we see is quite, quite smaller in comparison to what previously have. Uh, we have seen it several big impact at the very start, but it turns out that it was just CDN doing massive game patching upgrades constantly every week. Then we start recognizing it and, and all that, right? So one of those CDN that we have such issue with was uh, level three CDN, but we are in Asia, so they basically don't peer anyone. So there was this issue where in, in the initial course, uh, we thought it was a DDoS attack. Right, because everyone is at home, their device are on all the time, their game's console is on all the time. Uh, there was a spike, just a spike that went up, lasted a few minutes, went down. Uh, besides that, wise DDoS itself, we, I would really say that the frequency has reduced. Uh, I believe that's also to do with, I mean, the business are already not in the office also. So, the frequency really reduced by a lot. Uh, we do receive a lot of complaints, although not linked to network, uh, about scam phone or, or emails trying to pretend they are ISP to fish information. Uh, that's the other part that we receive a lot. Yeah, so um, actually, uh, any DDoS or it was uh, calm and quiet? Um, yeah, from, from our end, you know, uh, this is the best time for those hackers to attack, right? So, I mean, uh, maybe if you plot it on a frequency, it might be the same, but because we have more traffic right now and it adds to that, then you actually start to notice. But good thing there are augmentation uh, initiatives in place that we were able to address that. Yeah, and I mean, because high uh, demand of traffic, there is less uh, room to absorb such attacks. So, of course, you can have, uh, you can, face this problem. And I mean, quickly, uh, just a last question, uh, just taking around is, um, uh, do you, okay, something else popped up in the question. Uh, no, these are all old one. Um, is how many of you have actually sanitized the network equipment, uh, cleaning up with the uh, with alcohol wipes, uh, cleaning up your uh, stuff and routers and switches? Um, I hope nobody sprayed anything on on any of the router or switches. Yeah, but exactly. did you did you actually clean anything just to make sure that it is sanitized, um, uh, just for the sake of security? No, we didn't. I, I think they run pretty hot, <laughs> much hotter than the human body. <laughs> mm -hmm. um, I mean, so it's um, and the and the uh, likelihood for for a. Uh, for the virus to uh, stay active on any of these surfaces is very less, but still, uh, I think people were very uh, careful how they were dealing with it, wearing gloves and wearing, wearing masks and everything. So I'm sure um, uh, once people go back to the data centers, uh, hopefully it will be virus free um, and uh, we can go back to our normal uh, working environment, spending uh, hours and nights and days in data centers, just, just sitting on the floor of the uh, nice cool data center somewhere. So that's, um, if anybody has any other question, um, uh, please uh, make sure that you ask um, if I'm not, okay. 
to all the uh, so there's one question this last one is uh, is there a trend or increase in dns traffic due to intranet traffic leaking to internet internet dns leaking misconfiguration vpn um so um let me try to phrase it that way um a lot of so most i, I, I don't think so there there should be uh, any impact on that one um okay quick quick one so most most of the people were using uh, VPN when dialing when when uh, working from home you saw any uptick in the VPN traffic or uh, they were they were not using VPN and an application based security relying on application based security rather than sending all the traffic uh, to their mothership or uh, to other headquarters and uh, using it from there or they were just using application based security any any analysis or any uh, more information on that um we yeah so i think at the beginning we do see a lot of vpn traffic in australia uh, and new zealand because we have uh, traffic sniffer that we can identify them um at the closer to the middle after a week or two we do see a sudden drop uh, we do not know why uh, one of my assumption is that uh, the, the office simply discovered, like us, ourselves, we discovered that our firewall is not capable to withstand the, cap the capacity. Right? So we uh, start finding ways to get around. Um, so that's what we observe in Australia. Uh, in Singapore-wise, we don't have anything in the middle to observe that. Uh, it's on the layer 7 side, so we would not know any of that. Yeah, you're saying something? Yeah, it's um, a bit similar here, but uh, the idea was uh, at first everybody wants to get secure, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera, you know, and 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 then and the video calls came in, and after a while, you know, people started to realize that you can talk to somebody without using your video. So it doesn't mean you're gonna use a video call. You can use the phone then people, you can use the standard SMS. So it, it, it actually evolved. And in some way, because of that, you kind of uh, balance the traffic in your network from internet and data and regular uh, uh, calls and voice messages. Okay, and uh, just a closing question, if somebody want to pick it up. Um, do you have any um, major highlight you learned during these uh, lockdown period? It could be an incident with, which made you realize something was broken inside your network or something else or something, anything, any major highlight of this of working through uh, this period. I mean, uh, some of us are still going through it. Uh, luckily in Australia and New Zealand, we are almost out of it. But um, so what, any, any highlight you would like to share with, uh, with the community? So for I'll us start. in okay. Myanmar, Sorry. Yeah, go ahead, Ms. Wang. The biggest advantage is attending the meeting. We do not need to go to the far away to attend the meeting, especially government meeting. Before that, we have to fly to the, another city. Now it's very easy. We can stay home and uh, attend the meeting. It's a very big advantage. The government is also start using online application. Well, it's, it's, a bless, it's a blessing in disguise, I would say. <laughs> yeah. So, so um, uh, Archie, what you were saying, please go ahead. Yeah, um, probably the main realization is uh, from an infrastructure perspective is there's no, no really perfect network. You know, uh, we plan this like a, the detail that everything's going to be good. We're going to cover everything, but uh, nobody foresee the, the pandemic and we're going to lock down and traffic will rise like couple of uh, 100 gigs but uh, the learnings after that is you always need to evolve the infrastructure and we need to inform everybody uh, now uh, localization and multiple cables multiple hubs etc hearing has, has shown a different meaning in, in, I mean, internally in most of the local uh, ISPs in the Philippines and I think uh, this will uh, pave uh, a new way in terms of uh, further interconnection and optimizing and you know taking part of the greater internet uh, I mean the global IT community 
Okay, great. Uh, Nan, any highlight? So most of people talk about the, the planning, was it the network planning, but today is, is a real situation. So we, we need to uh, like uh, prepare it and learn from it. Yeah, so I mean, so there were, uh, I, I think um, there was very short period of for planning. It was more like uh, we have to do this right now uh, today, tonight, or maybe tomorrow morning. So yeah, I understand. Uh, Mark, uh, any highlight um, from the from this lockdown? And uh, we are still going through it. Uh, from my last week, my highlight is Murphy's Law is very scary. <laughs> um, we have a whole series of what could go wrong have went wrong. Uh, is that what I've learned is that anything we plan, right, when we are executing it, you, the, once the first blow lands, nothing is according to plan. <laughs> so um, you have to be very adaptable, have to respond very fast. Um, a lot of SOPs has to change uh, to prioritize um, recovery instead of fault finding. Uh, even if the fault will be much difficult to allocate later, uh, we will have to do that much in advance. And that's something that is a highlight of what uh, I have learned in this period of time, right? Besides the traffic pattern, which has some very strange pattern, which early in the day when it first started, everyone start going to YouTube, start going to Netflix for an hour, disappear, the traffic slowly grows, after lunchtime, a bunch of traffic is there for some odd reason, and dinner time it goes even higher. So I, I don't know. It's human behavior. Yes, and uh, new new content coming in on Netflix and Amazon Prime so much so that human behavior uh, is changing as well. Um, uh, I would say thank you so much um, to all my panelists. Uh, it was really nice uh, talking to all of you and sharing uh, and learning that what was happening in uh, in your part of the world. Um, and, the, and the thing is, make sure that you keep on running the internet as it is, because it hasn't broken. Uh, people who are saying it's going to break the internet, nothing, uh, because we have some great mind, great people on the ground, um, working from home and trying to make sure that everything works as it is. So I'll hand it all back to uh, Sienna. So thank you, everyone. Thank you for listening. And if you have any questions, please uh, reach out uh, through uh, and if it, uh, at afinic.net, if I'm not wrong. Sienna, over to you. Thank, thank you, you so thank much, you. Thank you so and much. thank you all of the yeah. presenters. Um, and that's a wrap, folks. The presentation slides and session recordings will be published on the NFH website shortly. Did you enjoy today and want more? Don't forget to register for the next NFH event at nfh.apnic.net. We'll shortly be sending out an event survey. Please do let us know how you think we went today um, and suggest any improvements for the future because we definitely will take them on board. Thanks to everyone who has joined us today, particularly the presenters, panelists, all the uh, Southeast Asian NOGs and PC volunteers. Please support your local NOGs, super important. And don't forget the online only APNIC 50 is coming up in September. It will be like this, but so much more. Registrations will open in the coming weeks, so look out for that. Thanks again. We look forward to seeing you again in upcoming weeks and stay safe. Bye-bye.